Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 29th meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone here to either switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. And before we get started, I'd also like to welcome in our public gallery, we have members from the California State Legislature who are, are here to to speak to our committee later on today, so welcome to you. Um, the first item of the agenda is for the committee to decide whether it wishes to take agenda items four and five in, in private. Okay. Thank you. And the next item on our agenda is to hear from the committee on climate change on Scotland's climate change adaptation programme. And I'm delighted to welcome Baroness Brown of Cambridge, the chair of the adaptation committee, Chris Stark, Chief Executive, and Catherine Brown, the Head of Adaptation for the Committee on Climate Change. And good morning to you all. It's very nice to see you all. So I think I've, we, we've been looking at um, your comments on the previous climate change adaptation strategy of the Scottish Government and your recommendations. Um, and I've got a couple of questions about your methodology and how you came to your recommendations and conclusions on that. Um, throughout all your recommendations and your comments, there's, there's issues around data gaps, and we're very interested in that, you know, not really been able to assess certain things because of, 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 of data gaps there. What was the process that allowed you to determine the adaptation priorities, the, the, the 12 for buildings and infrastructure, the 10 for society and the 5 for the natural environment? I shall ask Catherine to, to take that one because uh, she's been closest to that. But of course, it's, it's both about the um, climate change risk assessment, CCRA2, um, and what comes up from that in relation to the UK, but particularly in relation to Scotland. And then, of course, it's also about the areas where we can measure adaptation. And it's a combination of those. And I think Catherine can take you through the detail of that. Sure. Um, so we, we chose the same adaptation priorities for our first assessment of the, the SCAP report, which we did back in 2016, and we repeated those for, for this most recent report that was published in March. What we found when we looked at the first SCAP was that the outcomes and the timeframes of how the, the, um, the vision and the actions were delivered were, were a little bit vague, and that made it quite difficult then to put in place a proper measuring process to um, ascertain whether those outcomes are being met or not. So what we did instead, and we've done the same thing for, for the National Adaptation Programme in England, is to come up with our own set of what we call the adaptation priorities, which are set around um, both what type of climate risk we're looking at, but also what type of receptor we're looking at. And if you split things out by what we call receptor, um, then it becomes easier to assess progress towards meeting a particular outcome. So by receptors, I mean things like people or buildings or wildlife. So it's, it's easier to do the assessment when you're trying to measure vulnerability if you're splitting things out by those different receptors. But then you also need to think about how the risks are interacting on those receptors. So splitting, splitting the way we did into these 27 priorities meant it was, it was easier to, to come to those outcomes. Um, and it's something we've done, as I said, for the, for the England programme as well. OK. Stuart, you had a question on, on something uh, that Catherine said. Thank you, Camilla. I, I just wanted to probe uh, whether you are looking at this simply uh, in terms of the effects, or are you attempting to baseline where we are so that you can identify the delta from that baseline? Or are you doing both, which I suspect we might want to see because what what is before me says comparatively little about baselining and quite a lot about uh, the critique um, and i ask it particularly because i think uh, since the 2009 act which as you know i took through um, the the shift in baselining throughout that period has been a difficulty in distorting what may or may not have been happening sometimes over-exaggerating progress, other times under-reporting. Take that one as well. I, I mean, that, that baseline, baselining issue is, of course, a particular challenge when we come to looking at reducing CO2 or um, greenhouse gas emissions. I don't think it's such a, a significant issue when we're looking at 
adaptation priorities because, of course, we are, we are looking at, you know, we, we don't see lots of rebaselining of, of trends in seabird populations or something like that. That's, you know, that's, you know, we have sort of good data sets that run on some of those things. But, but our methodology is about, first of all, is there a plan? So um, are, are we presented with a plan and a plan that is actually focused on uh, adaptation? Then, and, and does that plan uh, take into account the changes in climate? So the, the kind of things the Met Office will be predicting for a two degree pathway and uh, something closer probably to a three and a half to a four degree pathway because sadly, even though we're all working hard to towards one and a half, and Scotland has some real achievements in that direction, uh, we know that there's still a significant probability we won't globally be on that pathway. So we must take into account uh, the risk of, of much more significant climate change. So is there a plan and is it based on science, if you like? Do we see that there are actions taking place? Uh, and research in, is good, but actually we do need to be moving to action. Um, and are those, and then, is progress being made in managing vulnerability? And of course, we may see action taking place, but not see progress in vulnerability. And then we need to be asking whether <coughs> are we taking the right actions? Perhaps we haven't fully understood the scientific mechanism, so the actions may not actually be addressing the vulnerability. Or is this a timing issue that we won't see the impact of these actions until a number of years um, down the road sort of thing. So we, we do this assessment against, is there a plan, are actions taking place, uh, and are we seeing progress in, in measuring vulnerability? Can I just add a little bit on that about indicators? So I think the, the baseline issue mainly comes in when we're looking at the third of those questions, um, and, and to some extent the second. But when we're trying to look at changes in vulnerability as our measure of, of progress, we, we do have baselines for quite a lot of the indicators and Climate Exchange have done um, a lot of work for us um, up here to, to populate those indicators. But for things like, say, numbers of heat-related deaths or numbers of trees infected with, with red band needle blight, those sorts of issues, we, we do have kind of a, a baseline number. But what we're more interested in, is, as Baroness Brown says, is, is the direction of change, really, in vulnerability. So are we getting more vulnerable to climate change risks or less vulnerable? And that's really what we're trying to, to look at. And, and as I've mentioned at the very start, throughout your recommendations and your comments, there's lots of areas where you're unable to really make an assessment on progress because of lack of evidence. What can be done to address that? What, what, what recommendations have you got around, around that? Well, well, some of those are, are actually, we believe, quite straightforward. And you may be, you know, there are quite a number of things in, in the second SCAP where things are about to be published or we're about to hear about things. So we're hoping that um, in a year or two, you may have covered some of those evidence gaps. And so, you know, there are some specific evidence gaps which are just about collecting the evidence, which are things like um, the, the use of sustainable urban drainage systems uh, in Scotland, where uh, we, we can't see any data to say how that is progressing uh, and some evidence we haven't been able to find about uh, developments in, uh, of, of housing in flood, potentially flood-prone areas. So that's just an issue of, of collecting that data. Those are relatively straightforward. Um, there are some much more challenging areas that, are, that of course, the whole of the UK uh, is, is, is grappling with, uh, particularly around the natural environment where we are still actually looking for what are, what are the right indicators for um, improving resilience of parts of the natural environment and therefore what data should we be collecting. But I think there's a, there's a particularly um, important area uh, around soils uh, and in particular farming. And I suppose one of the gaps that we are a bit concerned with in the second S gap Second scap uh, is this area about the replacement of the uh, of the cap and whether what sort of environmental land management um, scheme that Scotland will be introducing uh, and how will that in, how will that take into account the need to adapt in terms of improving soil quality so that agriculture um, can continue at least as effective as it is today uh, and also how will that take into account things like 
um, using land for natural to produce natural flood resilience by appropriate tree planting or allowing certain areas of farmland intentionally to flood to protect parts of the built environment and, and things like that. So until I suppose we can see that, we don't know whether uh, how, how good progress looks as if it is in that area. But, but clearly doing that is going to require all sorts of data collection that doesn't go on, probably doesn't go on at the moment. I mean, you alluded to this earlier. You're seeing the same kind of gaps and maybe trends across the whole of the, of the UK in all of these areas, or is it just Scotland-specific? Oh, I think in, in, uh, there are a lot, in the natural environment, there are a lot of gaps which are common to the UK as a whole and, and real opportunity for collaboration. Yeah. Because these are not, some of these are not, some of them are straightforward data that just needs to collect, be collected, um, like suds, for example. Mm -hmm. Others are much more complex, like some of the natural environment ones. And that's more Catherine's specialist area, so she may want to add some comments. Yeah, so the, the natural environment ones that are, that are very similar to, to the gaps UK-wide are metrics around soil health, um, pests and disease incidents and, and vulnerability to different pests and diseases, uh, and, and some of the water quality metrics as well are a bit lacking ac across the whole of the UK. Um, I'd, I would say, historically, I think we, we have seen more data gaps in Scotland, and, and one I would draw out in particular is on the flood risk management, <coughs> excuse me, where... Uh, in the past, we haven't had very good data on the numbers of properties being built in flood risk areas or sort of future projections of flood risk. But the, the recent update to the National um, Flood Risk Assessment has, has really helped to, to plug some of those gaps, which um, is really positive. But there are still gaps remaining, particularly, as, um, as Baroness Brown said, on uptake of sustainable urban drainage options yeah. um, and the adoption and maintenance of, of SUDS as well. So I think that's, we highlighted in one of our recommendations, that's one of the key areas we'd like to see more done on. Okay, well, I'm going to come back and speak specifically about flooding in, in, in a wee while, but I just want to, again, on the theme of the methodology, to what extent do the adaptation priorities overlap, interact, have an effect on one another? I mean, that, Obviously, you have to. You're putting together this 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 information. You're categorising, but they all kind of like feed into one another. Is that correct? I think one of the challenges, generally, we find with with adaptation is it would be very nice to compartmentalise it as you know. You have to look at this. You have to look at this, and then you have to look at adaptation. Adaptation is something that that runs through everything to do with our, how we live in our towns and cities, uh, how we run our health service, uh, how, we, um, how we improve our farming, how we do our forestry. And you can't kind of take it out and put it on the side yeah. because the fact that our climate will be changing, even if we're on track for one and a half degrees, there is still quite a lot of climate change to come. That means we have to think about building our buildings differently. We have to make sure that our hospitals are, are prepared to manage highly vulnerable people in what could be what will be much hotter conditions uh, we have to recognize that unless people's homes um, can be kept at uh, good temperatures in in winter and summer then when people are working from home their productivity could be significantly lower so it's not a separate thing it's actually something that, that if we've got ambition to make our farmland more productive we've got to recognize you've got to do that uh, as the soil is, is and as the weather are changing. So it has to be a thread that runs right through everything and not put in a kind of yeah. category at one side. Yeah. And that makes it hard to, hard to think about sometimes. Yeah. It, it, it is very broad, as you've probably picked up from looking at it, and this is our attempt at drawing together in as discreet a way as possible the priorities. So, I mean, I, I, they do overlap, but this is, I think, a very good attempt to, to distill them into meaningful, distinct categories. Um, and, you know, we are on a journey to make that easier for you. And uh, similarly, the policies that, that, that flow from it, uh, you know, need to be a better aligned to those things in the future. OK, thank you. Right, I'll move on to questions from Finlay Carson. OK, we're looking at the natural environment specifically. Of the five adaptive priorities, the natural environment uh, over Action Team 3 are showing slow progress and two, showing high concern. So that's... That's uh, reflected in the significant loss of biodiversity we've seen and the, you know, the biodiversity emergency we're really experiencing in Scotland. I, I would like to ask specifically about um, the pressures on freshwater habitats and uh, particularly from non-native invasive, uh, non non invasive species. Um, 
how easily can this be addressed? And is enough being done, considering there would appear to be a, a pullback of funding for tackling this issue? Yeah, so the, the assessment we made of fresh water, we put rivers and locks together, and actually you see quite a, a difference between lock condition and, and, and river condition. So lock condition generally has been quite good um, over the last five years, but we saw river condition was uh, not meeting quite a few of um, the targets set out in the Water Framework Directive. The, the issue of, of non-native species is, is a tricky one because we, we do expect more species or new species obviously to be coming into the UK and moving further north um, as the climate changes and their invasiveness or otherwise depends on their, their degree of harm. So obviously not, not every non-native species that's coming in is going to be a, a problem species but obviously there are some, some really... Um, Re really difficult species that are causing a lot of problems, like some certain types of mussels, um, new types of fish that are coming in that are actually disrupting the food chain. And, and once they're established, it is very difficult um, to, to eradicate those species and you have to have control programs put in place. But one of the things we've picked up which, as part of our UK wide work really is, is the way that climate change is factored into policy on, on invasive species. So generally speaking, um, if, if a new species is coming into the UK and, and we think that's caused by climate change, it's not included um, in, the, in the policies for invasive species. And, and that, that's obviously a, a problem from our perspective because it doesn't, the, the cause of that introduction shouldn't really matter. It should be the, the degree of harm that that species is causing. So we, we do think there needs to be more join up um, between the, the climate adaptation policy groups and, and the invasive species groups to, to try and prioritise which ones they think are going to be most harmful. But a lot of it is about monitoring and, and trying to prevent um, introduction and, and establishment in the first place because then it's much more costly to, to do these eradication programmes. So given that the water quality in, uh, in almost half of Scottish rivers is currently uh, not improving, and, and we see, if you like to, to describe them as traditional non-native invasive species like giant hogweed, giant Japanese knotweed, rhododendron, uh, just to, you know, the plant species. Um, is this a battle we can win? You know, we're not, we're not even in the midst of the, the, the biggest impact that we, we can foresee for with climate change. Um, and we're failing to address these traditional, if you like, species. Can we Can we win the battle if we don't? start to improve right now and make dr dramatic uh, increases in funding to, to get rid of them? Gosh. That's a, that's a very difficult question, isn't it? I mean, of course, it, it, there's also this, this balance that Catherine, I think, was, was um, drawing out, which is that some of these species will become our new... Is, will become the new normal for us. Um, and... You know, the issues are the ones that are going to be for some reason damaging. And we, you know, it's, we need, I think, a lot more thinking about which ones of those are we, are we worried about. To some extent, you know, we recognise as the climate changes, our wildlife will change. We, we can't persuade um, wildlife that likes cooler temperatures to stay if it gets too warm for them. But we will get, um, we will, hopefully we will maintain or even improve biodiversity because new wildlife will will come and, uh, and visit or, or colonise, uh, and similarly for, for plants. So some of those new species, you know, will just become what replaces beech woods or whatever it is in, in the future, and uh, we need to recognise that our, our landscapes will change. Um, we need, I think, to identify those that we think are going to be are potentially damaging because, as, as Catherine said, they could alter dramatically the food chain or something, and they could um, affect species, you know, species that would otherwise have stayed here because they won't be able to find the right things to eat. So it's, it's actually narrowing it down and finding out which ones uh, we think could, could be dangerous. And that may or may not be a large number. If it's a large number, we're going to have a really difficult time. But if we can focus it down on a small number, we may have a chance of, uh, of addressing it. So it, just, just to, to, to bring my uh, section to an end, do, so do you think the SCC uh, AP adequately addresses your concerns in relation to these high areas of concern? So I think that remains to be seen. So I'm, I'm just to go back to your earlier question, I think you, it, it's, you, need, you can win if you define winning properly. So this, mm. is, this is about ensuring that we are well adapted to what's coming and that we've reduced our, our exposure to those things that we're 
particularly vulnerable to here in Scotland. I don't know whether the second SCAP does that because we haven't made a full assessment <laughs> of it. But what I can say is that overall, when we look at these issues in the second um, programme, uh, it's much better brigaded under the right things and it gives me much greater confidence that the Scottish Government has started to put together a proper plan that might allow you then to get into the question of whether we are winning on that, on that, on that basis. So overall it looks okay, it looks like it's heading in the right direction, but I couldn't say for certain that I can, that, you know, I can't give a definitive answer to that question. And I, and I think we probably would say in this, in this area of freshwater rivers and locks that um, there's a mention of beaver protection, which, uh, uh, you know, a great nature-based solution in terms of um, helping to regulate flow. Um, there's a mention of the river basin management plans, but that's, I don't think that's new, but we haven't looked in, in detail. Um, and there's mention of research on, on river temperatures, which is important, but there isn't a huge amount, as on, on our first look at, at SCAP2, there isn't a huge amount in this particular area that looks like it's, it's taking us forward. So we, I think we would, again, we haven't looked in detail, but this looks like an area that does need um, continued significant focus. Okay. The number of members that might want to come in on invasive species, no? Is it on invasive species? Stuart Stevenson. Um, it's just a very simple question, probably with a complex answer, hopefully not. Uh, is the Scottish Government, and indeed the UK Government, insofar as you can comment on it, um, operating with the right international advice? Because this isn't a problem that simply is geographically constrained to these islands, and, and therefore strategies that may be being adopted elsewhere might be appropriate here. And the same invasive species, I guess, will be moving up the climate change in Scandinavia, perhaps in North America and so on. So is there international effort that we're part of? Well, certainly um, the part of the, the process of putting together the climate change risk assessment, and we are just now in process of producing the third climate change risk assessment for the whole of the UK, and we have particularly asked all of our um, researchers and chapter coordinators to look at the uh, very closely at the specific issues for the DAs. So I hope we'll be able to produce a strengthened report for of that for, for Scotland, and that will be bringing in research internationally in all of these areas. But I, I think you probably make a very good point actually that that in terms of you know for example flooding, um, we talk a lot to the Dutch who have, you know, of course, extensive experience uh, in this area and some very, very good practice. Um, and uh, I think you make a very good point, which is a question of whether we are doing enough with our, our particularly, our, as you say, our northern European neighbours. Uh, and I also think it's one of the issues that we might want to, to have as a, uh, a theme in the forthcoming COP in, in Glasgow in 2020, uh, this issue of you know, sharing uh, information and experience uh, with, with relevant countries on, on some of these issues. I think it could be a, uh, a very useful uh, thing for us to, uh, to be bringing up. But, but Catherine, specifically on the, uh, on on the, the advice... the detail of, of, say, invasive species or other species coming in from, from Europe. So we, there are very good um, surveillance programmes in place that are coordinated EU programmes. So we have... You know, we, we know where these species are, we know how they're moving, and this applies both to, like, big species. So, I mean, you mentioned giant hogweed. That, that is a health risk, that plant. So, obviously, it's, it's established and there's good public awareness programmes around it and there's an eradication programme in place. Um, but for things coming in, so different species of mosquitoes and, and what they're carrying, so we've, we've seen tick-borne encephalitis has, has now arrived in the UK. That might not be because of climate change. Climate change might be one of the driving factors, but it might be to do with, with migratory species and, and other, other reasons as well. But part of, the, part of the battle really is knowing where these things are and spotting them as soon as they arrive. And I think across the UK, we're, we're, we have very good processes in place to do that. Um, it's, it's probably more some of those species maybe that, that are not on the, the target list of invasive species that we're not keeping such a close eye on. Um, and, and as Baroness Brown said, you know, some of those may be a problem, but some of those may just be uh, the natural progression that we're going to see because of warming temperatures. And, and we, we very strongly highlight that conservation programmes across the UK, including in Scotland, need to start taking into account these, these inevitable changes so that you're... Um, trying to protect what is there and keep it as it is at the moment in a lot of cases isn't, isn't really going to be feasible in the future. 
Thank you. Mark Ruskell. Can I just come back in on uh, your comments about agriculture and uh, soil conservation and, and land management? Because um, obviously this was an area which we, we talked about a lot in relation to mitigation and the climate change bill. And there's now a reference in the climate change bill in Scotland to agroecology. Um, so I'm just wondering what you see as the, the way forward on this. What, what should be the, the defining approach to how we manage soils better, not just so they can lock up carbon, but so that they can become more resilient going forward? What, what, what does that look like on the ground? If you're a farmer, um, if you're a, you know, running an agriculture advisory program, what, what's the key approach here that's needed to really tackle these two issues of adaptation and mitigation? say something at the outset, shall I, and perhaps Catherine might want to come in at the end of this. So the first thing to say on this is that everything is about to change, and um, we need to get prepared for that. So, so, so the point when we leave the cap is a really, really important moment for land managers up and down the UK. And we know that there are plans afoot to replace that with something else, both in Scotland and in England, but I would say here that the, the plans to do that in England and Wales are much better developed than they are in Scotland. Um, we have to start considering land as a natural asset, not just as a way of producing food. Um, and when you open that up, you get into the discussion as it's framed in, in, uh, in Westminster, certainly, of, of public money for public goods. And amongst those public goods, would, I would list all of the things that you, that you framed your question with. Um, I don't see in Scotland the same commitment to developing a detailed policy uh, on those issues yet. And that gives me some concern. So when we think about climate change adaptation and mitigation, I don't think when it comes to soils and to the use of land in Scotland that we can say we, could, we can see a fully developed policy prescription in, in, in the making. Um, so that's, that's pretty concerning for me. And um, that's one of the reasons why I would continue to, 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 to rank soils and agriculture as being of high concern. Um, that's something we're going to have to keep focusing on, I think. And, and the scat mentions... Because uh, one of the soils is one of the areas where, and, and soil quality, soil health is one of the uh, the areas of challenge for data. And the SCAP does mention the uh, that soil research is to be done to identify metrics and uh, establish a soil health framework. Um, it would be good to see some timescales on that. I know that's challenging, but that really is one of the the very important um, fundamentals. And, and you've got some somewhat different challenges up here than perhaps we have in down in East Anglia, for example. In East Anglia, we're looking at you know massive loss of topsoil and the impacts of, of drought. And up here, you're looking at potent, you know already a 27% a uh, increase in, in rainfall since the 1960s. So there are some some different some very different challenges for soils in, in different parts of the country. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the Scottish Government does have a, a, a plan for, for transition, um, certainly for the next four years for agriculture. I mean, have you looked at that? Is your, is your analysis partly based on current policy or, or what you think may or may not be coming after that period? I mean, are we, are we moving quick enough on this? So, again, the, we haven't made a full assessment of the second SCAP but I would note that it doesn't make mention of what's going to happen on that policy programme in the SCAP. Um, I have looked at the development of this because I think this is one of the big areas when we think about UK-wide climate change issues. This is one of the areas that I'm most concerned about. And, you know, Scotland is a third of the landmass of the UK, so this is, this is a really important issue for Scotland. So when I see uh, Westminster motoring on developing and a placement to the cap, I mean, we could criticise that here too. Um, I, I don't see the same detailed prescription happened being laid out in Scotland yet so I mean I think that's something that you know we'll be badgering the Scottish Government to see over the coming uh, months and years and I suppose the, the one of the issues that uh, that we would say is that this the fact that adaptation kind of has to run through everything the fact that the environmental land management system doesn't even get mentioned in the second scap is is kind of ooh, somebody um, somebody somewhere didn't, you know, didn't have that adaptation is going to be critical to this. So, so it may well have some important elements of adaptation in it, but it didn't get thought about when the SCAP was being put together. And that's a slightly worrying kind of thought that it isn't this, you must think about adaptation isn't yet, isn't yet sort of entirely cultural, if you know what I mean. It, it doesn't come entirely, uh, 
entirely naturally. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing we have to say well done to Scotland on, um, and that's the, the peatland restoration. I mean, you've already beaten your peatland restoration targets, which weren't terribly taxing, but you've now set some much, much stronger ones, and that's really positive to see because, you know, we all know that that the, peat, the functioning of peat is both critical to things like wildlife and water quality and adaptation, and also, you know, globally, peat is, I think, the single most uh, best store of, of carbon that we have. So, so you know, uh, well done on, on being really ambitious on peat, and we need to see the rest of the UK um, taking on that kind, of, that kind of ambition. Are you seeing enough linkage from... Um, well, it appears that there's, there's not really much at all on soil conservation, but enough linkage into the work on freshwater ecology. So, you know, we've had some worrying evidence that there's maybe a scaling back on river basin management plans. I mean, it, it, a river basin management plan is a way to sort of drive some of this catchment level work on soil conservation. I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we ensure we're taking a, an ecological approach to the way that we're dealing with soil and water together? have been um, in the past, yes. So, so the IBMPs have been very useful at, at thinking about things in a more spatial way, as you say, on a, on a catchment scale, and looking at the interactions between what's happening on farms and, and with either diffuse pollution into river courses or, or in, the, in, in the case of peat, actually washing of the peat into the, the water course. And um, what we've tended to see, actually, is water companies are a really key player in, in, in this particular issue in terms of how they're then treating water and the fact it's so expensive, particularly if you've got discoloration because of, of peat loss into water, that, you know, this is this is millions of pounds being spent on, on water treatment and actually that's been a really good road in to, to trying to fund some of these peatland restoration projects is actually doing them through water companies. Um, what we would really like to see through the, the future environmental land management schemes is, is a much more holistic approach. And, and if you're looking at payments for public goods rather than, um, rather than area of land or anything else that, that you might use as a metric, that is a very good mechanism to achieve that. But, but uh, as Chris has said, we haven't really seen any of the detail for Scotland yet on how that programme may work and where adaptation features. And, and uh, even understanding soil health and having the metrics to show what soil health looks like across the country is still very challenging. So that really is the, the kind of fundamental and issue that we need to Is anybody at. doing that work anywhere in the UK? Is there, a, is there a consistent analysis of metrics of soil health? Who should be leading on that? Is it, you know, is it definitely we started started a programme to do just that. And I, and I think just about in the time frame available, we can, we can envisage that that could be turned into a meaningful policy. And that's the point, really, is that, that we will run out of time to do that properly unless it starts in Scotland too. Right. Okay. So Hamilton, you that. I, I'm just curious as to why um, there, there isn't that. There is insufficient data. I mean, um, farmers have been soil testing for years. I know it hasn't been mandatory, um, but I suppose it's just that data gathering that has been the problem. It's not been mandatory for all those those years. I used to be an agronomist, so um, I mean, it was, it was a fun, you know, soil is a fundamental natural asset, and I think it's the basis for um, potential uh, decisions about production in the world. Um, and you know our, our um, food, food security. So I find it absolutely astonishing that that, that there is insufficient data. And I, I don't know if you could, if I have touched on it, is that why that why that is? But have you got any other comments? I think we agree. <laughs> um, certainly on the the sort of fundamental importance. So soil and water, obviously, are the two the two really fundamental key assets that you know. Doing agriculture in a changed climate in the future, you're going to have to have good soil quality and good water availability and quality as your, as your underpinning basis, even if you're changing what you grow and you're changing from agriculture to forestry or whatever you're doing with land use, you absolutely have to have good soil quality and, and good water quality. Um, I think our view is that, yes, we are surprised there is not a national level soil survey and... Um, I mean, certainly in England, you know, the last national survey was done in 2007. Um, I haven't seen evidence of a national soil survey in Scotland, and we know that in, in SCAP2 there are actions to um, improve the research around what we're even measuring uh, in terms of soil health from a climate change point of view. And part of that is, is about soil carbon, um, obviously for, for the mitigation benefits, but as a, as a proxy indicator for overall soil health. But there's also just soil, soil erosion potential and the amount of soil we still have left. Um, and yes, we're not, we're not sure, to be honest, why it has been such a problem, but it is a UK-wide problem. It's not just a Scotland issue. Okay. 
Thanks. Just to, could just briefly add to that, since we have it in front of us. So, so in our high-level assessment of the second SCAP, which is all we've been able to do, you know, let's just run through the issues. Um, there's no high-level commitment to addressing soil health, soil health that we could see in the SCAP. Um, it does mention the the program, uh, the Farming for Better Climate program, which is good, of course, but um, uh, we we the, 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 we don't see the the kind of development of a detailed policy program that we've seen in England for for elms that goes alongside that. Um, we've got soil risk maps available, which is good. And there is commitment to doing some more soil research, but there's no timescales attached to those things. So it's a sort of half-baked, half-finished um, programme. Now, this is an area where Scotland can make huge progress. So the optimistic take on that is that there's a, there's a, there's a pretty low bar that you know, we could raise quite quickly, I think. But um, just as you say, a lot of this is strange, given the, um, given the particularly the, the, the academic excellence in, in, in agriculture and in, in Scotland. Right, I move, want to move on to talking about building and infrastructure. Um, and I said I would just uh, questions. Um, oh, right. Hang on a second. Before we go on to that, Claudia wants to come in. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, it, it, a lot of this has been covered already um, by the panel, but there, there are some issues in relation to the natural environment where mixed progress has been highlighted. And uh, you have... Uh, I think those are terrestrial species and habitats, um, forestry, marine and coastal ecosystems, um, all of which are, of course, fundamental. And um, uh, Baroness Brown, you've touched on peatland already, and I wonder if you've got any comment on the fact that in Scotland there is still um, some uh, peat extraction going on, and there seems to be a conflict in relation to um, where we are with the positive side of peatland action. So I wonder if you've got any comments on that. Um, and I, I agree with you that, you know, we're very keen to see peat, ex peat extraction stopping. We're very keen to uh, stop, uh, to see uh, a ban on, on peat in the, uh, uh, in the compost, particularly for, you know, that you and I can go into the garden centre and buy, which is appalling. I recognise that for commercial growers, they may need, uh, they really need a phase-out plan to understand what they can use in some cases to replace it. But, you know, there is absolutely no excuse for the fact you go into a garden centre and it's quite hard to discover whether the bag of compost you're buying actually has peat in it or not, in fact, these days. Um, the, the, you know, there is... None of us in our gardens need to be, uh, need to be using... or in our pot plants need to be using peat. So I absolutely agree with you that we should be, you know, we should be phasing out. Of course, sometimes you have communities whose livelihoods are dependent on some of these things and they need plans. They need, it needs, you know, as in all these things, we need to be thinking about uh, a just transition, perhaps in adaptation as well as, uh, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as mitigation. Right, thank you. And uh, we've, we've touched on forest cover as well. Um, I was interested uh, in your comments about beechwoods, um, Baroness Brown, because I'm puzzled by where the beechwoods would go. I mean, we talk about things moving north, but uh, and, and, and you highlighted with um, the questions from my um, colleague uh, Finn Carson about the, um, that some things will move, move and uh, are things harmful or not. But in terms of the um, food chains and ecosystems that you've highlighted, it would seem to me that it would be at our peril that we lose our, our very um, robust beach native woodlands. And I wonder if you've got... If, if you can comment further on that. That was more a comment because I'm talking to the National Trust on Wednesday down in England and, uh, and one of the iconic English landscapes is, is, uh, is, um, uh, uh, is, is beech woods and actually with the drought that we're seeing in parts of England, uh, it may be that some of those beech woods in England won't be sustainable. Uh, sorry, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, a, I, I wasn't just... meant to be a Scottish comment, but I don't know, Catherine, if you have an equivalent sort of <laughs> Scottish example. Um, well, so, I mean, certainly in Scotland, some, we know that some of the northern forests are under threat because they are very cold tolerant species. And, and you've got, you know, some fantastic ancient forests up in the north of the country that, pro that probably, you know, given, given what we're looking at with some of the higher um, climate change scenarios, they're going to go and they're going to be replaced with, with something else. And, and that, that needs to be worked through with, with proper analysis to see what the chances of that are and whether there's pockets that, that may remain. But this is what we're talking about when we say conservation needs to shift to be more flexible because in some cases there is nothing that can be done. You know, species are going to be lost because their, their climate space, as it's called, is, is running out. But, but Beach is an interesting one um, from a climate change point of view because 
because it is quite a drought prone species so beech trees do not do well in in dry conditions whereas some of the other native english species are a bit more robust to drought so you know beech woodlands bluebell woodlands are the sort of thing that we, that we are particularly concerned about given given what the projections are telling us right and, and you'll know it was 100 years of forestry debate last week where we celebrated our our forests and woodlands and community woodlands here and and uh, um, the, I think there is a very positive view in Scotland of continuing to preserve and indeed enhance our, our, um, our native um, ancient forests, um, our ancient pine forests, but I'll just put that on the record. Um, could I just turn uh, lastly to, we've talked about freshwater um, rivers and lochs, and uh, could we focus our minds on estuaries and the coastal um, environment as well? Um, and in terms of, of those ecosystems, the marine ecosystem as well, um, I understand that the ecological status of estuaries is not showing signs of improvement, and of course there, there's the decline that everyone will know about in, in seabirds. I'm not going to quote the figures in terms of time, but um, th those are causes of a, for concern. And I wonder the degree to which the ecological status of estuaries relies on the health of the fresh water, rivers and lochs, and if you've got any more broad comments about estuaries and marine environment. So we, we, in this case, we have lumped together a few things that are quite different, yeah. So we've, as, as you're pointing out. So we've yeah. put marine in with, with estuaries and coastal waters, and, and I think, yeah, as you've said, on the marine side, you know, there's, there's a good amount of protection going on. Um, a, lot, a lot of marine protected areas have, have come on in the last few years, and, and, and that's looking quite good. But at the same time, we're seeing big declines in some seabird populations, particularly populations that are reliant on food like sand eels that we know is changing because of climate change, and, mm. and those populations are declining. And that is, that is one of the, probably one of the impacts of climate change that we're starting to see. And again, it's, it's quite tricky to see what you can do about that, apart from getting these these habitats in, into good condition. I wouldn't say we've done a lot of work to look at the causes um, of the, the poorer condition in estuaries. And as you say, it may be to do with some of the upstream effects. Um, but estuaries are very, very complex ecosystems, um, as I'm, I'm sure you're, you're well aware. And you know, it's, it's, it can be tricky when you've got upstream and downstream effects to, to try and preserve what you've got there. Um, and again, maybe the, the flexibility point that, that we've made already is, is a really key one for estuary condition. But part of it depends on what the, what the condition is being measured by. So sometimes it's due to the presence or absence of a very particular species. And if you're seeing those species moving because of climate change, it may be that you need to change the, the condition metrics that you're using. But we would need to do more analysis to really be able to give you a, a full answer, I think. Thank you. That's helpful. Now that I was getting ahead of myself, move on to buildings and infrastructure networks. I apologise for that. It, Two things in this, I think, that, that struck me. One, that, that you said it was um, difficult to do uh, an assessment on flooding adaptation because it was difficult to collate the information that already is in, in how flooding has been taken into account when things are built um, and planned. So, first of all, what is the difficulty there? And given that... I guess there's processes that you go through in order to, to get planning permission in local authorities or there's large infrastructure projects that are more substantially um, uh, built, for example, big infrastructure. That data must exist. So what's not been done and what should be done in order to actually have flooding built into that and to be able to, ha to do an assessment on whether it's been done or not? Do you want to cover that, Catherine? Yeah. I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll say a few quick words about the, the data collection, but I think flooding as a, as a general issue is, is again, a, a huge one, partic and particularly in Scotland, that, that there's a lot of factors involved with. So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the National Flood Risk Assessment gives us now much better data about the number of buildings that are located in flood risk areas. Mm. I think the gaps that we've seen are about development in the floodplain, um, the fluvial and the coastal floodplain. And I think, you know, th this, this falls under SEPA's remit, and, and we've had um, lots of ongoing discussions with SEPA about the data gaps, and part of the problem is that um, it requires local authority uh, resourcing and data collection and then um, collating that all together at a national level to get those numbers, and that, you know, that can be an expensive task to do. It's not that the data isn't 
measurable. It, mm -hmm. I think it's more of a cost and a resourcing issue for local authorities. And um, the conversations we've had with SEPA suggest that they, they just feel they're not, they're not resourced, really, to bring all of that data together. Um, but I wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, whether that's, whether that's right. the full reason or not. And, and in terms of actually like my, um, factoring in flooding into all those decisions, um, I mean, you mentioned a bit, something about a cultural, we talked about yeah, a culture change. Do you think that that is foremost in the minds of people you know, like planning these developments, these issues around looking to the future and looking to the potential for you know, cl an impact of climate change on flooding? Do you think that's happening? I think sometimes people have very conflicting priorities. And sorry to quote an example from, from England, but, you know, for example, in, in the southeast of England, uh, the, um, people have a, uh, and Homes England have this priority of hundreds of thousands of new homes in the southeast. And the, the challenge to that is many of the areas where you could build them are in floodplains. And, and uh, also, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about affordable homes. And therefore, you get into the challenge of, yes, but we need them not to be on the gas grid, uh, and uh, we need them to be uh, prepared for hotter, much significantly hotter summer temperatures. So we need that extra insulation. We need those triple glazed windows. Uh, we need the a proper, proper ventilation systems to uh, avoid damp and discomfort. That does add... You know, we can't say that's for free. It's much cheaper if you do it when you're building the new home, but it, but it does add to the cost... Um, and it actually adds to the challenge of the building skills that you need to make sure those homes are really built to the very high standards that you might be specifying them to. Uh, and it actually also needs more of them to be tested uh, when they are built to check they are meeting those higher standards. Uh, and that's a, you know, that's a tension against a real urgent need to build new houses and targets on the number of new houses built and getting the building industry to respond by building them to a high enough quality and fast enough uh, and the temptation to put them in places where uh, in 50 to 100 years time you will really regret having developed communities in those areas because we could be looking towards facing you know a meter of sea level rise mm. uh, so those are the those are the kind of tensions that that people are faced with and so we do need um, them to be thinking adaptation is, is really, truly important and it must be a very significant part of that, of that decision-making. We'll, we'll, all, we'll all have, um, round down this table, certainly examples of where we have like, constituents yes. who have been flooded and it's a case of, you know, well, that was a one in 200 year event. That's never, it's not going to happen again while you're here. But of course, the damage is already done. There's psychological damage there. And the onus has been put on to homeowners to actually just sort of like, you know, and, and be ready years, for that as opposed to any kind of In 20 years mitigation. time, it won't be a one in 200 year event. Exactly. You know, to yeah. be a much more common event. And of course, we always have that probability of, the tale of, the, of, of seeing the tail of the distribution. We can't ignore mm -hmm. that either. I mean, just add briefly on that, I mean, it, this is true of every area. That I don't think really in any sense that fundamental and inevitable impacts of climate change are being factored in. I think there is a temptation, and you see it actually in the, in the, in the SCAP as, as well as in, you know, in, in many of the government's approaches to these, these issues. There's a tendency to jump to sort of acute care for some of these things and instead to understand, instead what we're actually talking about here is that some of this is, is utterly fundamental. You know, this is a real change in how we need to do policy generally right mm. across the piece mm. and that's true in the commercial world as well flooding is probably the most obvious case where that's where that's um where that needs to be done and yet you know we look to sepa to do a new flood plan you know that's that that is not going to solve in any real sense the underlying issues that come with the inevitable flooding that comes with climate change so you know i i don't see and i, I have to say i don't blame the scottish government um uh, any more than i do any other government around the world that that the, the, as we lift the bonnet on this thing, we understand that more and more of these things really are that kind of that are, are have that fundamental nature, and it's very difficult to grasp. So, you know, part of what we are here to do is to raise in a in a in a non-alarmist way the, the 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 genuine risk that comes with that if we don't address it properly. And factoring it into all the decisions right. that we're making, because when 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 things like a one in two hundred year event is said, well, actually. We probably should be throwing that out because actually things are changing too fast. We we would very much like to see 
all government departments and all businesses um, thinking about what are the implications of you know, being on a 1.5 to 2 degree trajectory because you absolutely have to be looking at the risks associated with that. And in, even in a 1.5 degree trajectory, the, the climate goes on changing you know, beyond the end of the century, but also because there is this still a significant probability, you should be looking at what would happen under a three and a half to four degree yeah. trajectory, and that every decision where you know, climate change could be uh, in an impact, which is almost anything, has done those two assessments, and people have faced up to, this is what, you know, this is what the weather and the world could look like, is what we're doing robust against that. Because that's, that's a kind of logical risk assessment that everybody should be doing. And we, we don't even see uh, everybody doing the two-degree one, let alone thinking about the four-degree one. Yep. Finn Carson, you want to come in just, on that? Just on that, um, we, we've got a, a, a new document here. Does, this, does it have the teeth? Does it, is it fit for purpose? You may have policies, but is it fit for purpose to deliver new laws and whatever whether that's planning or whether it's protection of biodiversity, is, is it fit for purpose to actually deliver those uh, in, a, in a timely way that's actually going to address this? I think, in, I think we would give you a tick for really good progress in, in the health and social care area, some significant steps in the right direction. But I would say in, there are several other areas where it still really doesn't have the teeth that you need. It's a much more elegant if I can use that word, um, program. So it, I think it makes it's coherent, it makes sense, it's, it's well laid out. Mm. Um, it, still ha it still looks like a mapping exercise, and I say that with someone who's had experience of doing these mapping exercises. Mm. They're really hard. So, I mean, I think it's a good place to have begun, at least. But um, whether, it, whether we can say uh, in truth that it's driving new policy, new ambition, new activity... I think that's the, the, the jury's out on that. So, that, so that I, I'm happy that this framework that's been established, especially that the way that it links with the national outcomes and the, and the UN's SDGs is, is a good one. I mean, that's, that's definite progress. But um, it, it still looks like that policies have been slotted in to a framework rather than reversing that process. So I would like to see in the future that framework now being used in anger. Mm. And specifically on what we've just talked about, about um, flooding resilience and or you know, adaptation in order to avoid people being in a situation where they're being taken out of their homes at three in the morning by boat, as, as I've seen. Um, are you seeing any anything in the, the Scottish Government's adaptation programme that, that gives you any kind of comfort there that that's been addressed? There's certainly some steps forward to map. Um, we look forward to that plan I mentioned earlier from SEPA on flooding. I think that might be the point at which we can make a better assessment of that. I mean, I, I, I think it's difficult for us to say clearly here that it and, does that. And I think there's a, we're expecting from you a, a code of practice on the uh, property level flood resilience measures, um, which is due about now. But we haven't, I, we certainly haven't seen that yet, I don't think, have we? No. no. So there are some, you know, there are. There are some things coming. Uh, I think when, when those come, it'll be easier to assess whether they are really starting to, uh, uh, to address the issue. Um, there's no mention of, of shoreline management plans in, in the second SCAP, uh, even though I think only 10% of the Scottish coast is, is covered by them and 19% of the Scottish coast is, for example, er deemed to be erodible. So there's clearly elements of the Scottish coast that are that could be eroding could be eroding quite fast but of course there's also then the how much of the Scottish coast is is inhabited and how much has critical wildlife around it so all of that sort of needs mapping together to tell whether there is a gap there or or, or whether actually you're reasonably well covered and I don't think we don't we don't have that that evidence <clears throat> okay we've yes. still got quite sorry. a lot to cut sorry carry, carry on carefully I, I just wanted to to raise a point as well that for, for us, flooding is a very visual impact. It's Everybody knows when it happens. It's very easy to see the impacts, and you can see the aftermath of that on people as well. 
and we can measure that for some of these other risks to people in buildings that we look at particularly overheating which is a very hidden risk that's something that we're equally concerned about uh, as with flooding if you look at the, the summer set temperature for, for heat waves at the moment in Scotland it's about 25 degrees but some of the work that's coming out of climate ready Clyde suggests that can go up to 35 eight, even 40 degrees by 2070 under some of these scenarios so I just we might want to talk a little bit about the overheating stuff as well but I just wanted to to sort of raise the, the, one of my colleagues might be, be picking that up um I'm just we've got half an hour left with with our uh, panel members uh, colleagues so can we keep our questions uh, succinct i'm going to move on to questions from stuart stevenson um thank you i'll i'll simply ask about uh, digital infrastructure which uh, is uh, resilience uh, is listed as an area of high concern um, given that uh, the 1998 scotland act uh, Schedule 2, Paragraph C10, specifically reserves telecommunications and wireless telegraph telegraphy and internet services to the Westminster government rather than the Scottish government. Um, what role is there for the Scottish government in uh, resilience of the telecoms? And more to the point, given that it does matter to us, uh, what are Westminster actually doing to promote resilience in Scotland? Or what's their responsibility? Well, this is one of the areas that we have a concern about nationally and, uh, and clearly um, better connectivity to some extent will deliver better resilience and, and um, increased uh, reconfigurability of the, of the infrastructure in Scotland. But actually our big concern nationally in this area is infrastructure interdependencies um, and that's particularly important for um, digital as part of that is particularly important because, of course, when there is an emergency, we all very much rely on being able to communicate. And we've had a number of instances where the digital infrastructure has failed because of an interdependency that actually people weren't aware of. So an interdependency on a, a particular electricity substation that actually it wasn't even clear was affecting the digital network in that part of the world. So this is an area we are pushing the, the, uh, the government in Westminster on very, very strongly. Um, we are very disappointed that um, the Westminster government has not chosen to make the adaptation, this next round of the adaptation reporting power mandatory. We would like to see it as being mandatory for all critical infrastructure providers to report on their progress, um, on, on their progress and their risk reviewing uh, against uh, how they're planning for adaptation and how they're looking at the interdependencies. Um, we get, um, we come slightly into um, into a kind of a bit of a wall with the cabinet office um, because some of the against some of what are national security issues around some of these interdependencies and so things that uh, for you know good reasons uh, may not be in the public domain but we do still have a concern in this area that this area of infrastructure interdependencies is extremely complex uh, and it really does need um, it really we really do want more assurance from the UK government that it is being very thoroughly reviewed and we would very much like to see the adaptation reporting power being used as the Climate Change Act allows them to being used as a mandatory requirement for all these uh, all these critical industries to be reporting so that we can see publicly um, what they're doing about about these issues. I don't know if you want to add anything to that Chris. Or... Uh, just a very brief thing to say that I've got, well it's true to say that as you say, they are reserved powers, and that um, when it comes to certainly digital infrastructure, this is something that Westminster needs to needs to have a plan for and have policies in place to manage. It runs counter potentially to a devolved policy, of course, to expand connectivity in, in in Scotland if 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 that new infrastructure is not resilient. So I do think that even in that discussion, although it is a reserved matter on a very narrow, and then if you take that narrow outlook. It, it is absolutely the case that there is a devolved competency and a, and a devolved issue that the Scottish Government should care about. Well, if, if I may, the devolved competency is for economic development, not for communication. Agree, completely agree. Completely agree. I think they have a stake, therefore, in ensuring that stake, there is that national yes. planning. Yes. Yes. And, and just to give you a sense of that, though, I'm not aware that there is an active campaign from the Scottish Government to ensure that, that infrastructure 
digital infrastructure as it's installed is resilient. So that's a good. So that would be a good example of where a, a Scottish government, the Volcom team around economic development, um, uh, played through into a clear position from the, the Scottish government of what they what they demanded from Westminster. Uh, sorry, Camilla, but isn't the Scottish government played into that through the joint working on? the critical national infrastructure I so. definition. I, I, I don't know is the short answer I'm, that, but I'm, I, I hope I, it is. <laughs> I, I, I can speak with some degree of certainty. And in my previous life, I used to be visited annually by GCHQ to see that my computer <laughs> centre was... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move yes, on to talk about other infrastructure that, that of a similar similar vein, I suppose, uh, I suggest Angus McDonald's questions on energy supply. Yep. Uh, uh, thanks, um, Camina, particularly on uh, energy uh, networks, uh, the resilience of our infrastructure there. Also, uh, I'd hope to look at the uh, ports, airports and ferry services and infrastructure dependencies. So, um, Looking at electricity supply disruption due to severe weather, other than uh, flooding, who do you think should be responsible for collecting, collating and analysing data in relation to energy supply disruption? I'm going to hand that one to you, Chris. Well, I'd sign, I'm, I, the, the straightforward answer is I, I, that I don't know, but I would, I would look in my previous life. I was once responsible for, for these issues in the Scottish Government, and um, I, I know that there's a, a very good um, uh, service provided by the utilities in Scotland, Scot SSE and Scottish Power. So when it comes to those energy networks, I would be looking to them to provide that data. OK, so you'd be con content that they have the capacity to do that? They certainly have a very active programme of managing extreme weather, um, I think it is absolutely excellent, the service they provide now, and it has come, of course, from a, a history of that not being the case. So um, I'm afraid I don't know what data is collected from the, from the utilities, but that the asset owners themselves is, uh, is who I would look to. OK. And would you say the Scottish Government's electricity and gas networks a vision statement adequately addresses resilience and adaptation concerns in relation to the energy supply? Well, I don't think it does address it. Um, I'd be happy to look at that further after this, but um, my, from my reading of it, I don't recall that section being in the, um, in the networks plan that they put together. OK, um, but we know that work's ongoing. Uh, well, just looking at um, uh, ports and, and airports and, and ferry services, um, we know that work is ongoing on the National Transport Strategy uh, to be completed in, in this session. But f what steps are necessary to manage climate risk in relation to uh, port, airport and ferry infrastructure? What's I mean, I think this is a pretty straightforward one, actually. I think it, the, the, the new national transport strategy just needs to acknowledge those risks and to put a plan around them. So actually, this is, this is an, the, the, here is an infrastructure class where actually you can put together good plans. Um, uh, and, I would, and just to echo something that Baroness Brown said earlier, those plans should be well, well, should look well into the future and, and should be capable of managing the kind of temperature increases and changes in weather that come with those temperature increases, much more than two degrees, up to three or four degrees centigrade. And in, in, the, in the lifetime of the assets that we're talking about, particularly for something like an airport, that is absolutely something that should be in the national transport strategy. So I, I'm pleased, actually, that, that, uh, that, that, I think that I think the plan for that national transport strategy is that there will be a 20-year look ahead. Over those 20 years, you're, you have actually pretty predictable changes in the climate that that will need to accommodate. And I would just add that a 20-year look ahead is great, but when you're thinking of assets that have lives longer than that, um, there should be some recognition of, of asset lives and a further look ahead and making sure that the things done over the 20 years are things that are can be enhanced to meet a 40 or a 50-year uh, mm. climate resilience and not dead ends that will need kind of redoing or sort of starting again uh, to look uh, to look at the, uh, the the weather and climatic conditions beyond that. So to make sure that steps are being taken on a pathway, because you may not need to have 50-year resilience on day one, but make sure the steps you've got are part of your pathway to to the resilience reflecting the life of the asset. Okay, and and um, th there is work uh, ongoing to, to to that effect. Um, finally, from me, convener, um, would you say that the SCAP adequately addresses the, uh, your concerns, the CCC's concerns, in relation to areas of high concern? Well, there's the, the you know clearly the area of high concern around digital in infrastructure is 
is a high concern, but it's a high concern across the country for, for reasons we've, uh, we've, we've talked about. Uh, I think it, I'm trying to remember whether the other specific, in, in certainly in the infrastructure area, the digital infrastructure, I think, was the only area of high concern, which were the other. Yes, and, and I mean, the other one that I, that I would flag is the infrastructure interdependencies, mm. mainly because there is there is a gap in, from what, our, you know, our, our quick reading of SCAP 2 to date suggests that, that there isn't really anything substantive at the moment in SCAP 2 that looks at this interdependencies issue. It's a very difficult one to, to get into and to model um, and to come up with actions for, and we are looking at that as part of the third UK climate change risk assessment, so there will be updated evidence for Scottish Government to use um, from 2021, but we'd obviously like to have a few a few more discussions, I think, on, on how to get into that one um, as a, as a follow-through from SCAP 2. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, move on to questions from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and uh, I'd like to focus our minds uh, in a little bit more detail on uh, society and adaptation, where there has been mixed progress, as, as you'll know. Um, what would you see as the key barriers to improving performance in relation to societal adaptation? And also um, the acid question of, um, have you been exploring at all in your policy work? Um, who actually pays for this? Do you have a view on this in relation to, I mean, we've got Scottish water in front of us next, and is it the consumer, just to give one example, but you know, much more broadly than that, the consumer, the taxpayer, both, or... Obviously, business has a part to play, and how does this all get put together? Uh, I, would, I would say, actually, in a way, it's not for us to say who should pay for this. I believe those are political decisions. Okay. Um, it is for us to say these are things that need to be done, and these are, um, these are some of the metrics you can measure to see whether we are progress, you know, we, you're progressing with making things happen. Okay, but so I would fair say enough, sorry. Who um, pays is absolutely could, a political could decision. Could I rephrase that, not rephrase it, but ask part of the question again, which is what would you see as the, bar the main barriers to moving forward then? Well, I, think, I think quite often that is one of the main barriers to, uh, yes. <laughs> to moving forward. And the, and the fact that um, quite often conventional, um, conventional cost-benefit analyses don't work for some of these things where we are planning for um, a 20 or a 50 year horizon mm -hmm. um, where actions we take now um, affect something uh, a problem that that is going to be with us in earnest perhaps in in 50 years time uh, and you know as Catherine has mentioned you know this study that shows the potential for for temperatures for example in the center of Glasgow I think the modeling was you know potentially re reaching um, 40 degrees well uh, things you're doing in that in the center of a, a historic city now uh, could well still be around <laughs> in 2070 and you do need to be you do need to be thinking on that very long term scale and of course that isn't a very natural time scale for elected governments to think over because it's sometimes investments now that won't see you know you won't realize that that was a brilliant thing to do for an awfully long time <laughs> mm. but, so that those are, that that is yeah. certainly you know That's lots helpful. of issues around the costs are certainly a barrier because this is about investment now quite often for quite long-term benefits. And you, you've already highlighted, um, you, you used the phrase just transition, which obviously came into mm. our Climate Change Act um, for the mitigation issue. Um, in terms of the, um, the societal um, changes that are needed, um, do you, any of you have any comment on how to um, identify and support the most vulnerable to climate change in Scotland and how they can become engaged and empowered um, uh, to be able to adapt? Yeah, I, so I just, I just want to, I mean, it, it's, it's tempting in these moments to hand out lots of criticism. But actually, one of the areas where I think Scotland is very good and the Scottish Government has been particularly good is in raising the public understanding of what's happening with climate change. So, and, and, and that's one of the areas, for example, where we've noted positive yeah. progress. We are far from done on that, but it's really important that that happens. I think, though, that is not enough. So in answering your question about vulnerability, one of the issues when it comes to climate change adaptation is how hidden some of these impacts actually are. Mm. And if you think, for example, on health and social care services and what happens in a, in a nursing home, for example, with something like overheating, yeah. I don't think that just telling people that that's something that's coming is going to fix that particular issue. So I think we need to have something much more fundamental. This is really where the role of government and the state comes in, actually, which is to understand those risks Yes, to raise the public understanding, but also to make proper provision with decent policy for what we know is coming. And I think that's, it's in that area where you see the answer to the question, what do we do about the most vulnerable? You need, mm. you need the government to protect them, because it, it is not just a question of raising 
um, public awareness. Um, I, there, is, there is lots to say uh, on that, potentially, but I think, in general, the Scottish Government have, have raised the profile appropriately, I think, in, of, of, of these climate risks internally, and now we need to see that play out and manifest itself in better policy making. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we move on to questions. Final questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks, Kavina. Um, I just wanted to ask you finally about the, um, the key recommendations that you've made. I mean, you've got a number of ranked uh, recommendations. You know, the top one around measurement of vulnerability to climate change seems to wrap in a lot of what we've discussed around infrastructure and, you know, soils and, and, and a number of things. But could you just explain kind of your thinking around the, the ranking of these recommendations? Um, they were ranked in order of... Uh, in, in order of importance, and as you say, to some extent, uh, the f number one was a bit of a catch-all actually, because it, it catches some of the uh, some of the the later ones. Um, but it, it really is about um, making sure that, that you know we have metrics and measures, and are we have metrics and are collecting data in in some of these uh, very key areas. Uh, I think you know the first element of that was overheating risks in, in buildings and monitoring of internal temperatures in hospitals and care homes. And we think you've taken some good steps in the right direction uh, on that one. The, the next one was, was soil erosion. And as we've discussed, we think um, it shouldn't be difficult to do that one, but we think that's a critical one and should come in as, and we have the possibility, you have the possibility to bring it in as part of the environmental um, land management system re replacing uh, CAP. We've talked about the challenge on infrastructure networks and severe weather. And the one we haven't really talked about is, um, what is what is business doing to prepare? And we would say we're, we're very pleased that you still have the, the sort of climate ready uh, business advice. We think that's very good. Um, we would very much like to see um, all businesses focusing on both a two and a four degree. Um, clearly for very small businesses, the four degree may not be <laughs> so important to them, but, but certainly for, for large businesses and businesses that are important um, in their communities, um, to see them doing that, that long-term planning, we think, is, is very good. And I think we, we didn't see a response in our quick look at SCAP2 of what research is being done to see whether Scottish businesses are uh, actually um, preparing for climate change. I'll just, I'll just add a comment about the ranking. Um, so we, we have some overarching recommendations, which are about what we want to see in SCAP 2, and then recommendation 1, which is about the, the monitoring and data that, that Baroness Brown has just gone through. I would say the rest aren't necessarily ranked in any priority order. So the sector-specific recommendations we've made about heat and cold, suds, um, dothostromy, needle blight, etc., those are all things we picked out because they were area of high concern, but we're not necessarily mm -hmm. suggesting that recommendation 6 is, is higher than recommendation 9, for example. Okay, okay. So, no, that's, yeah, just clarify. That, yeah. So there's a bit of a kind of step process here because if we improve the baseline, um, particularly around vulnerability, that could then drive you know, suggestions for, for further action and the extent of that action is obviously dependent on the data you get. So how do you see this process evolving in, in relation to the plan and, and updates to the plan and the emerging picture? I mean, are we moving, you know, fleet of foot enough? Are we can this plan be responsive enough to the changing data that might come in in 12 months or 18 months or two years' time? I think we would say you have a good framework and we very much like, and, and looking at SCAP 2, um, we think the framework set out and the outcome focus are very positive, are very a good practice. And, and actually, I think we would, we would use that, some of that with DEFRA and say, look, this is a great framework for setting out the, uh, you know, and, and understanding which are, are the key policies. Um, we don't yet necessarily see that some of the policies listed in the framework are properly addressing or have properly incorporated adaptation. So I think the framework looks, looks very good and can be adaptable. Um, clearly, we need to be sensitive to new science. That's one of the reasons why we do the climate change risk assessment for the UK every five years. That's Actually, I think a reasonable timescale in terms of picking up new science. But, but of course, we all need to be responsive in all areas of, of climate change to, to new science because, um, you know, if the science changes, the, the plan needs to change and 
we may need to recognise some of the things we did were not were, the, were our best judgment at the time, and that's that's great. But if the science changes, the action may need to change. But I, I think you've put together a framework which can be which can be responsive. Um, time will time will show, but it, it looks good. Climate change planning and doing a, a, a published review of the Scottish um, climate change adaptation plan. The, the, the asks for it, we will do it. I uh -huh. mean, I think we will, of course, return to some of these assessments. So, um, but the way that the Act works is we, we need to have that request from them. So, right. there's, there's um, uh, you know, we, of course, we'd be pleased to do that if the request comes. Okay. Any other colleagues got any other questions? Is there anything you think that we've missed <laughs> that you wanted to, 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 to point out to us um, before we, we wind up? I, mean, I, I, I kind of wanted to make the general point that I, I, I made this point earlier that it's very pleasing to see this laid out like this. So actually, the, there is a, a big step forward actually between the last uh, programme and this one, even on a cursory look. So I think there's, I, I very much hope this framework that's now been established in the second SCAP is the one that we stick with and that we, we what we now begin is a progress of progressively improving our understanding of some of the metrics and the data. But crucially, that it, it becomes let, not not just a repository for things we're already doing, but instead a way of actually catalyzing some deep, some proper action on these issues. Mm. Because I don't really think there's anything more serious than the things we're talking about here when it comes to no. when it comes to climate change. No, and it will. I mean, everything we've talked about today will actually impact on every single exactly. citizen of Scotland. Yeah, and, and I would say I think you know our first look at SCAP suggests that we are seeing some positive progress. There's there's still a lot to do. Um, our first look was more positive than our than our review of the the second nap in in England. So, you know, you're <laughs> it's useful to have um, it's useful to have that comparison for uh, uh, for encouraging our colleagues in in, in England mm. to uh, to higher aspiration. But I guess this is a thing that's happening across you know all, all governments and all countries. Yeah. That, yes. that we're all sort of running to stand still um, yep. as this becomes it more and more uh, absolutely in your face as a, and, as a massive issue. And I would just like to say um, that uh, we had a, a Scottish colleague, um, Cara Labouchagne, who uh, supported us in pulling together our review, our second review of the first SCAP. Uh, she's um, currently enjoying maternity leave, um, but she did, I think, uh, a very good job for us, and I'd just like to recognise her publicly. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly. Thank you.
Welcome back. The next item on our agenda is to hear evidence on Scottish Water's future investment priorities. We've got two panels this morning. Her first panel, I'm delighted to welcome Douglas Milliken, <coughs> um, who's the Chief Executive, and Professor Simon Parsons, the Strategic Government... Uh, sorry, I'll say that again. I can never say the word Strategic Customer Services, Planning Director of Scottish Water, and Joe Dow, the Chief Executive of Business Stream and David Satie, the Assistant Director of Network Regulation for the Water Industry Commission for Scotland. Um, good morning to you all. Um, I uh, would like to talk about, or just get our, an update on where you are um, with regard to the investment planning cycle. If you could tell me where you are right now on that. Thank you. So we, as a committee will be familiar, we operate in, in um, multi-year uh, regulatory periods. We're currently towards the latter stage of the 2015 to 21 period. Um, so in terms of very much in delivery mode or in terms of investment commitments that we made some years ago for this six year period. And therefore, we're also right in the middle of the planning for the period that begins in April uh, 2021. And we've been probably in, engaged in that planning exercise now for two or three years. Is any of the, the timetable on that slipped at all? Are you on, on, on track? No, the, 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 the overall timetable is very much on, on track, and that's uh, very much with a view to final decisions being made in the latter part of 2020. Okay, and in terms of how you are put, um, putting together those plans for, for uh, investment, how long term are you looking? Are you factoring in changes for like, you know, 20, 40 years? Is, is that how far ahead you're looking? Yeah, so I think it's, it's worth saying that the, the approach we're going to take <clears throat> in the future is quite different to how it's been done up until now. Because up, up until now, including this period, the planning has very much focused on the needs for the coming six years, in this case for the 15 to 21 period. Whereas the planning that we're doing starting from tw April 21 is trying as best we can to look right out towards the middle of the century right. and try and look at all the different uh, challenges and, and, and pressures and opportunities that we can see out over that time horizon and then very much take that into account in what we determine that we'll do over the next few years. Yeah, because we just, we've just heard from the committee on, on climate change about you know, the climate change potential impact across all sectors. Yep all businesses, all organisations, is that very much in the back of your mind? So, I mean, I think when, when we look at, yeah, there, there are probably three major, major themes that sit behind our investment planning, one of which is that we've got a, a lot of assets that will need to be replaced at some point. Yeah. So replacing ageing assets is a big driver. But the other two big drivers are both climate change related. One of which is, that, is adaptation. We're already seeing the impact of the changing climate on the delivery of our services, and clearly that will only continue and potentially accelerate into the future. And then there's the other dimension, which is our commitment on the mitigation agenda and our commitment to get to net zero emissions by 2040. Mm. So in terms of the capacity, of, for example, of what you have right now until dealing with, for example, big weather events, We've seen the capacities maybe not there even even now. How are you building that in in terms of your your plans for investment? So <clears throat> it goes really right across our our, our, our whole system. So it's um, right the way from looking at issues to do with the availability of of, of, of water, how the, the the quality of that water might change in in some of our, our, our catchments. Then coming through the system to the adequacy of our water treatment plants to be able to deal with the variability in the quality of the incoming uh, water to be treated. Then clearly lots of pressures on the wastewater site in terms of the adequacy of the sewer systems to deal with the additional amount of surface water as well mm. as foul sewage. And then the impact on our wastewater treatment plants because of changing influence. So right across our system, we're seeing impacts. We're already adapting to deal with those changes, but clearly a lot of that will require more investment in the future. Okay. Stuart, you wanted to come in on this theme? or No? Okay. Just checking. Right. Mark. Yeah. Um, thanks. I just wanted to ask about the, the, the sort of interrelated drivers for investment here and, and perhaps use an example. Um, under the Bathing Water Quality Directive, um, there's a good example here at Kinghorn Harbour, um, where there's poor bathing water quality, that will obviously drive investment in trying to sort out the, the stormwater sewage and the domestic sewage to ensure there isn't bacterial contamination. But because there aren't regulations in relation to rivers, 
um, we don't see that kind of investment to ensure that there are, you know, we don't get um, sewage water overtopping into rivers, and as a result, there are various pollution problems um, in, in rivers across Scotland, including the River Leven, which is not that far from Kinghorn. H how much do those kind of, you know, EU directives um, and particular, uh, you know, regulations drive investment decisions? Because it surely doesn't matter to somebody if they live next to a river or live next to a beach about whether one is polluted or not. They just want both to be sorted out and for dirty water to not be coming into the river or the beach. But there's clearly an investment decision to be made there. I mean, if, uh, let me give you kind of a, an overview sense. Let Simon then maybe pick up the specifics. So I think over time, one of the, the really positive changes that we've made in very much in conjunction with CEPA is to look holistically at all the pressures on uh, water bodies and what is the optimal way to solve this, whether that's by Scottish Water or indeed by other parties. I think the challenge for the future will be not just looking at what do we need to do from an aquatic environment, but what do we need to do from a holistic environmental angle, all with a, a view to the notion of one planet prosperity. But Simon, do you want to speak specifically on the, on the water? Yes, so um, the way you're obviously familiar with uh, the Baden Water and the work we've been doing around Kinghorn, for example, um, if we look across rivers where we discharge into across Scotland, um, for example, we have very tightly agreed licenses with, um, with CEPA, so we would be operating to a very, in essence, a recipe of um, contaminants we need to remove from, from, from those wastewaters, and that will be agreed, monitored, and reported quite regularly to, to CEPA. We'll also also look at what's changing in those rivers and whether or not the, the actual um, standards we operate to um, will, will actually change. In one of the areas, I think, just picking up on the point there, is around discharges. So, if, for example, if we have too much uh, surface water going into our sewers, the sewers by nature are actually uh, designed to, to overflow into rivers. Um, and that's the nature of, of how they're, they're, they're designed to operate. And we're working with CEPA, for example, to prioritise across Scotland, as part of the long-term investment programme, prioritise where we need to put the greatest investment in uh, to deal with those overflows, as well as the work we do on our individual wastewater treatment works. But is, is there parity there, though, in terms of the, the driver for investment decisions? I mean, if you... If you live next to the River Leven, you'll see, you know, wet wipes yes. getting into the river. And it's the same in, you know, the River Armand and various other rivers. Yeah. It, it seems odd that action's being taken a couple of miles down the road to deal with bathing water quality, which is right and proper. Mm -hmm. But there isn't the same kind of level of action when it comes to, to rivers. So, I mean, just so we will work very much with CEPA in terms of agreeing which one of those um, kind of discharges we need to deal with most. But as you all know, CEPA will be quite firm with us in terms of enforcement and actions if, if they believe that we're, we're not operating in, in the same way. I think the, some of the observations around wipes, for example, on the almond is actually we, how can we work better with the, some of your NGO organisations around the almond to educate people about not putting wet wipes down into, into the, the, the rivers, into the sewers, for example. And we're also working with CEPA and a number of other organisations around the leaven about how can we actually help regenerate the leaven, of which make sure the water quality and the amenity value of that water quality is also improved. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Claudia, do you want to come in, in on this? No, not screen? on this one. Thank oh. you. Um, in terms of engagement, Mark, you had some questions on the Scottish Water's engagement. Um, no? Apology. <laughs> Finlay. Um, uh, thank you. Good morning. I, I want to look at uh, your aspirations to move towards engagement methods which will give greater empowerment to communities and customers. And I want to put that into context with the absolutely dreadful reputation that Scottish Water have currently uh, in South West Scotland with uh, disastrous public engagement and actions in the back of it with uh, its new treatment works at, at Shawhead, Heath Hall, Traquia, um, real issues with flooding and Scottish Water's response to the community in Kirkubri, and the list goes on and on and on. So how are you currently engaging with customers and stakeholders as part of the process? And how can you improve on your reputation at the moment to, to help to build your um, social license to, to deliver the service? Well, firstly, we take uh, very seriously any failings in our, our customer service. And I, I'm certainly aware of some of the specific instances that you mentioned there. 
and if there are any areas where you feel that we're not taking action, uh, please let me know and I'll make sure that we follow up. So I know that certainly, for example, the Kukrubi incident you mentioned there, we, we are dealing both, both from a short term and uh, a long term angle. If I, if I broaden it out, we as an organisation absolutely seek to put our customers and communities at the heart of what we're about. I would not for a moment claim that we get everything right, but we have made very significant strides over recent years to uh, increase significantly the level of satisfaction that customers have across Scotland in our services. And at the heart of our approach is understanding where we have uh, let customers down, making sure that we resolve those issues and then learn from that and build that learning into our processes. If we then go more broadly into the whole area of engaging with customers and communities on future investment, we have engaged really extensively. We've spoken to about 25,000 people uh, uh, to inform our plans for the future in a whole bunch of different ways. So that's given us some very rich insights. And we are working ever more effectively with communities when it comes to investment planning. I think we're now getting pretty good at working with communities on how we deliver and trying to take community preferences into account. For the future, I want to go further and I want to increasingly involve communities not just in how we deliver, but what we deliver. Okay. Um, I sometimes feel, and I know this was brought up last year, that uh, often uh, interventions by Scottish Water when it, it comes to looking after customers that have maybe been disrupted or whatever, we find that actually commercial companies like Openreach go that extra mile, but Scottish Water continually have the excuse that it's taxpayers' money, we've got to recognise that. So, so how does your current uh, planning process seek to balance your, your ambitions for further investment with economic hardship being experienced by uh, both business and uh, non-domestic customers? Well, we, um, we work extensively, particularly through licensed providers and dealing with business customers, and we seek always to fulfil the expectations on us. So we, we learn from our experience, we learn from other organisations. So if there are good things other companies are doing we can learn from, we will, we will take that on board. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, may we move on to questions from Angus MacDonald. Thanks, um, convener. Uh, a couple of questions for uh, David Satie. Um, I was wondering if you could tell the committee uh, what the challenges are of regulating in a monopoly environment uh, and how do you avoid the relationship uh, becoming too close? Yes, so one of the main challenges uh, that we were uh, mindful of as we were uh, conducting or opening this strategic review was how do we think much longer term? Uh, as was alluded to in, in some of the initial questions. How do we uh, think about the challenges and opportunities over a much longer term so that we uh, can then put the next regulatory period into context better? Uh, we, uh, the Commission at the, at the start of this price review um, sought to use the principles of ethical-based regulation, which places an onus on Scottish water to build the trust and confidence of its customers and communities uh, and its stakeholders. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this level of engagement has resulted in open, frank, uh, challenging discussions about the, the challenges and oppor opportunities for, for the industry. Uh, and uh, it has created a, a level of uh, collaboration among all stakeholders uh, recently. Uh, from the invitation of the cabinet secretary, the industry worked together to develop uh, a, a transformational long-term vision for the, the sector. Uh, and, uh, you know, how we ensure that it is not cosy, uh, as you were alluding to, is to make sure that, uh, you know, everyone is open and honest with their uh, disagreements as well as their agreements. Uh. Okay. Do you have many disagreements? Well, there is many challenges that we impose on Scottish water uh, on an ongoing basis, um, uh, and they they are 
are lots of dialogue between each of the regulators about how do we best uh, create uh, value for Scotland as a whole. In thinking uh, longer term, um, you haven't mentioned climate change, so where does that feature in your priorities uh, for, for Scottish water, particularly in the strategic review of changes, aid charges in 2021 to 27? Yes, so a lot of the, the work um, to date has been understanding uh, the investment requirements for the industry. Uh, so what we have been doing is uh, looking at Scottish Water's asset base uh, and in light of uh, the net zero emissions target uh, and the climate emergency that was, that was announced, uh, understand what the impacts, um, what that would have on investment. Okay, and finally, um, given that it's uh, uh, the Water Industry Commission for Scotland was formed in 2005, would you say it's still fit, uh, still fit for purpose? I would say it's, it's very much fit for purpose. Uh, and not only that, but uh, as part of our hydronation activities, uh, many regulators throughout the world are knocking on our doors to, to understand how they can do what we are doing in Scotland in their countries. Okay, thank you. Finlay Carson, you want to come in? Yeah, just just a, a question again for yourself, David. Uh, what weight do you put on um, the importance of protecting the natural environment and biodiversity and whatever when it comes to, to balancing the need for maybe a community to have a new water treatment how do you uh, balance that with well, maybe the additional cost to the public purse, but ensuring that, for example, national scenic areas are protected from uh, development of water infrastructure? So it, the, the way, if I can uh, elaborate on how, how uh, the role of the Commission. Uh, so uh, ministers uh, set objectives for the industry, uh, and those cover levels of service, compliance, uh, and the level of contribution to help facilitate economic growth. Uh, and WEX determines the lowest overall reasonable cost of delivering those uh, objectives. Uh, so the, the, the trade-off that, that you were uh, discussing uh, would be covered off within the ministerial objectives. Mark, did you have a, a short question? Yeah, I mean, there was quite a lot of debate back in 2005 about what what WIC's role should be and what, what you should count effectively. I mean, you're an economic regulator. Do you feel that the other, the other kind of aspects of sustainability are, are covered by other bodies like SEPA or, or SNH or whatever? I mean, how do you, how do you look after that long-term public interest beyond the, the simple economic, well, I say simple, but the economic regulation of, of costs and, and investment? So one of the, the challenges that we have put forward to Scottish Water uh, as part of this strategic review is how do we incorporate um, the six capitals when assessing uh, projects going forward uh, so that it is not just purely financial lowest overall cost uh, of, of, of each project, but how do we ensure that we create uh, better value that incorporates uh, those areas that you discussed. Uh, so this is an area that's very active at the moment, uh, and um, he's within Wix to do that, or would you rely on SEPA to make a judgment about where where the investment priority should be? So the as uh, we would we would hope that at Scottish Water, uh, when it is appraising each each project going forward, uh, would uh, incorporate each of these uh, different variables into uh, how it appraises you know, projects. Uh, and then it is very much the role of WIC, SIPA, uh, DWQR and other regulators to, to assess whether or not they are, are doing that appropriately. Mm -hmm. Would you have the right expertise in WIC on sustainable development to interpret your economic regulatory role through the lens of sustainable development objectives? Do you have environmental economists? Do you have people who are looking at, you know, long-term long investment in, in those, meeting those sustainable development priorities? We have the right expertise uh, in order to 
ensure that Scottish Water are appraising the projects in, 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 in the way that we would hope they would going forward. Um, uh, I, would, I would say that we do have those expertise in-house. Okay. Um, now on to questions around capital investment. We've got Claudia. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just briefly as a follow-up on um, uh, questions to yourself, David uh, Sati. Um, uh, could I ask you, uh, just before we move to more of a focus on the capital investment side, um, my understanding is you set the charges for water customers. And uh, uh, in relation to both the climate emergency and the challenging sort of um, sorry, economic situation as well as environmental situation that, that those who are um, uh, being served by Scottish Water um, have to face, um, is, it, is it challenging to keep the charges affordable and how do you go about assessing that affordability? So the role of the Commission, uh, as I was saying, was to determine the lowest overall reasonable cost of delivering the ministerial objectives. That is, uh, to do that, we determine the amount of revenue that is required in general terms for Scottish Water. Uh, the customer forum uh, has uh, researched uh, and uh, is understanding and analysing the preferences of customers in general terms, again, uh, with respect to investment relative to price. Uh, how the revenue is then proportioned into different segments of society, including those that are financially vulnerable, is a matter of government policy through its principles of charging. And is that something that you, um, in your view, that that's being taken forward in a way that is appropriate for vulnerable customers, as you've got Citizens Advice Bureau um, uh, working with yourselves, or perhaps more with the forum, but, and, and we are having another a panel mm -hmm. from the forum, but is it, do you have any comment on, um, uh, are there concerns about customer vulnerability at all? Um, so, Citizens Advice is working with the Scottish Government as it develops its policy in this area. Mm. Uh, and it is an area that is always under consideration when determining, uh, you know, the future prices. Right, thank you. And, I, and I've got some uh, questions about uh, the capital investment for Scottish Water, but of course, if you feel it's appropriate to comment as well, you're most welcome, David. Um, I understand we've touched on net zero already um, and the, the aspirations and determination to, to move towards that in the climate emergency. And I understand that Scottish Water has a tool for um, assessment um, to deliver against um, both mitigation and adaptation requirements. And I wonder if you could highlight whether that tool is working effectively already or how you see things going forward and whether you can accurately know the costs and indeed the potential efficiencies that may come from developing ways to operate in the climate emergency. I don't know who'd like to take that question, but through the convener, please. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, I'll just give you an update on the tool. And Mark Williams joined you earlier, committee earlier in the year, to talk about the, the tool itself. So we, we look at... Um, in terms of our emissions in two ways. One, operational, which is relatively easy in terms yeah. of understanding and measuring, and then the, the embodied carbon, which is actually much more difficult to do in terms of that. So we have a, a tool which is actually built around, um, in terms of best practice across the UK, developed as part of the UK Water Industry Research Programme. Um, and that tool then allows us to look at projects, and we, we use it at the moment on projects above a million pounds. So we'll look at projects about a million pounds, and we'll actually look at the embodied carbon within those projects and then the options that we will, will choose. Um, and the idea will be then, as we develop our understanding and our library of solutions to a certain degree, we'll then be able to, to identify what might be the lowest, uh, simply carbon, uh, solutions for those projects. Um, so it's been used now, it's been used on all of those projects, probably been in action for about best part you know, six, nine months in terms of its, its day-to-day -day use. Um, we will already be capturing examples of where we've changed the material, for example, from Could you give us an example of that, please? Yeah, if I can just find them in my, my notes. So, for example, um, on our, if I'll get some, is our scheme up at Loch Ness. So we're building a new water treatment works up at mm -hmm. Loch Ness to supply the communities. 
Uh, there we are um, in terms of changing materials from steel to plastic, or HDFP. Um, there's an example where we can actually reduce the embodied carbon of about 90% on that part of the project. We've also got a project down in Howden where we're putting in a new uh, water main. By using an existing water main and doing some work around that, we can actually then significantly reduce the amount of pipe material we put in, and then we can use that as a way of um, reducing the embodied carbon in, in the overall scheme. That's helpful. You're saying you're moving from steel to plastic. Uh, are you considering moving... I hope you're considering moving, but I'll ask the question, to, from plastic to um, opportunities for um, the use of Scottish companies in um, remanufacturing of plastic and re using recycled plastic, or is the plastic recycled already in your... I probably don't know exactly where the, the material, um, in terms of the, the plastic material we use. Um, on the drinking water side, we're very, very closely regulated in terms of the materials we can use within... Um, within but sorry, would that be something you'd be looking into? You could look into course, yeah. the, yes. the yeah. where, where and, yeah. and what is being used. The, one plastic. of the benefits of the tool is it actually generates really good discussions. So you've actually got discussions about how could we reduce the, mm -hmm. um, the levels of CO, embodied CO2 in each of our schemes and each component part of it. And with our supply chain, with our, our colleagues within Scottish Water, um, it's really it, it, the real benefit for that tool is about generating those discussions about what could we do differently. Um, and as we get more experience, and we've got a library, and as we generate a library of good ideas and good examples, I think that will help us in terms of um, you know, really driving down the embodied carbon in, in all of our schemes. Right, thank you. Now, are you looking at um, uh, flood control or filtration um, through um, natural methods? Uh, uh, rather than hard engineering options, and if you could tell us briefly about that, yeah. that would be useful. And also, whether you're working, able to work with local authority, authorities on sustainable drainage systems, which have been raised with myself and others as, as a concern going forward. Um, so if you could say something about those issues, that would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, we listened to the conversation I had earlier about in terms of climate change um, with the colleagues who were joining you earlier. It's very clear that, um, you know, if you look at some of the future forecast you know, predictions for um, rainfall, um, our sewer systems and our ability to deal with that, you know, because we have combined sewer systems, our ability to deal with that additional rainfall will be really tested. Um, on that. So we're working to look at what are those blue-green infrastructure that we can actually use. Um, and we have two very strong partnerships here. One is the what's called the Metropolitan Glasgow Strategic Drainage Partnership, which has been running for a number of years now, and some very, very good examples there of how blue-green infrastructure is working. And I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on one of those specifically in a minute. And then the second one is we've got a newly formed drainage partnership uh, here in Edinburgh, which is ourselves um, uh, East Lovian and Mid Lovian and Edinburgh City Council, which is really looking at how do we plan for growth within this whole region uh, such that we can deal with flooding with blue-green solutions, not conventional big underground pipe sewer systems. Right. It would be helpful if... Sorry, are you going to say more? I was just going to, I was just going to tell you about one example, actually, of a, of a very good scheme. It's actually called yeah. the Smart Canal. And this is a very good scheme that's been built into North Glasgow. It's really it's using suds and, and the infrastructure around suds um, on that one. And it opens up um, an area of North Glasgow for about 3,500 houses uh, from memory. Uh, this is good work in between ourselves, Scottish Canal, and Glasgow City Council. And it's really about using um, the canal as a final route for the water rather than going uh, into the Clyde. Um, and it provides biodiversity, it provides green spaces, it has many, many multiple benefits associated with that type of scheme. And what you can see is that we kind of, you know, that's the kind of scheme that we'll be looking to demonstrate and obviously look to develop more, more into the future in partnership with local authorities, because mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's the route for doing it. All right, thank you. It would be helpful if, if um, you or a colleague were able to send us some, a bit more uh, detailed information on those issues. You'll yeah. know that we've been... Um, in Inverness, we visited a, a, a very interesting scheme as well about okay. removing um, culverts and, and work. I'm not going to go into detail now, but for the record, that was inspiring. And yes. uh, it's, it's important particularly for us to hear about how you're able to work in partnership with local authorities and SEPA and to develop the protections and the, yeah. and the mitigation that we'll need. Thank you. Mark, you had a 
Question? Uh, I mean, I suppose all industries are looking at how they make transformative changes in, in light of climate change. I mean, that might mean investing in something that doesn't, you know, appear to be economically efficient at first in order to get over that hump of, of innovation. Uh, I'm just interested in how the, how the WICs would, would then see that. I mean, if Scottish Water is investing in technology that, that perhaps might, you know, raise costs to consumers in the short term, in order to bring about something which can then be mainstreamed in the long term. How, how, do, you, how do you look at that sort of longer term profile? Should I give a comment first and then maybe David, because, because you, there was a question earlier as, as to whether our economic regulators are challenging. I can assure you they are very challenging. And one aspect of that challenge that they've thrown to us in this space is how do we understand what the long term cost of carbon may be? So when we're doing our investment appraisals, not just understanding what the cost of carbon may be today, but if we're making investment that might last for 20, 30 years, how do we know what the future cost of carbon is to make sure that we really are evaluating the real cost of carbon in doing our economic appraisals? And we don't have the answers to that one yet. We're, we're, we're grappling with it. But I think it's an example, I hope, of, of the sort of current challenge that we get from our economic regulator to make sure we are being robust in our economic assessments, but absolutely taking account of these really important environmental factors. So one of the key focuses for us going forward is how do we, get, how do we create a regulatory framework uh, that allows for greater innovation and collaboration? And one of uh, the key components of that is uh, to move away from a six yearly uh, list of projects and needs uh, to, more, to a more dynamic uh, and uh, transparent process for prioritising projects. Uh, so there will be occasions where uh, Scottish Water will uh, want to pilot projects uh, on, on the basis that it might not uh, be successful, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, and there has been occasions where that has happened. Uh, Dilmarnock and Daldewi is, is one such project. Uh, we would like to help build on that success and create a regulatory environment uh, that allows for a much more dynamic and ongoing uh, scrutiny of projects uh, to help enable that innovation. Finley, you wanted to come in at the back of that? Thank you. Um, in, in the future, we're, we're seeing more um, severe weather incidents and whatever, and that's highlighted some issues we maybe have with unadopted legacy drainage, particularly under high streets and, and so on, where it can lead to... Um, it, it's unmanaged, if you like, by Scottish Water at the moment, but it can lead to issues within the, the network that Scottish Water manages. And also the issue that we've seen in the past with unadopted suds, is, is there any plans within the capital investment to look at these unadopted um, floodwater networks or suds to, to ensure that there's resilience when it comes to more frequent uh, adverse weather conditions? This is a, a huge issue and we are actively engaged at the moment. We've got a, a team of about 50 or 60 people who are actively working at the moment and have been for some years on looking at what we can do to adopt a legacy uh, infrastructure. And... Um, it sounds really simple, but actually there's all sorts of challenges. There is, there's all the technical challenges, but there are lots of legal challenges uh, because uh, you, typically we do not own it. So for us to get ownership of it or, or sufficient ownership to enable us to, to then operate. But I, I can assure you that we've got a big team who are focused on it and we're working particularly actively with the development community both current developers, but we're also dealing with situations where we've got house builders who've become insolvent, and we're even dealing with some of those really challenging situations uh, too. Okay. okay, moving on to, um, I'd like to ask questions about what you're doing. You, you've already made a commitment to offset some of your uh, emissions by um, investment in, in, in peatland and uh, catchments, <clears throat> and increasing woodland as well. How is that going to appear? How is that activity going to appear in your, your balance sheet? Or is it going to appear in your balance sheet? I, I don't know whether it will appear in our, in, in our financial balance sheet, but certainly one of the, one of the commitments that we've made uh, is that over the next year we're going to develop a, a plan, a clear route map, to how we're going to achieve net zero by uh, 2040. And we've got, lots of, uh, you, uh, we've got lots of things in train, lots of, lots of ideas, but in really simple terms, 
it comes down to how do we minimise the uh, carbon and other emissions associated with our activities in the way that Simon spoke about earlier, both operational and embodied, and how do we maximise the positive contribution that we can make, whether that's through things like peatland restoration or the work that we can do in supporting more uh, renewables. So we've got a whole suite of different things that we will be uh, looking at developing further as part of a route map. In terms of whether they appear in our balance sheet, not clearly if we, if we invest in some re renewable energy, that will appear in our balance sheet. Um, I suspect uh, some of the other areas like peatland restoration, yes, they're of value, whether we'd actually ascribe a financial value to them in our balance sheet, I'm less sure of. In terms of like how we, how we as a committee and, and I guess the regulator can scrutinise those actions, you know, where, where can we see evidence of, of what you're doing in terms of offsetting? any emissions? Well, we, we will... Um, I mean, I think the, the, the first thing is we want to try and actually minimise what we actually offset. We want to try and maximise what we can uh, reduce. But to the extent that we need to invest to, uh, to, to offset, then that will be very transparent because we will be in, in effectively investing uh, customers' money in that. Mm -hmm. And in the nature of the new investment planning and prioritisation framework that is being developed, the, it's worth maybe if I can just go, go a little more broadly to, to explain this to the, to the committee, because this is a, a new process that's been put in place to support investment in 2021 and beyond. And the, and the first element of that is for us to identify needs that uh, should be uh, investigated, and we'll do that very much in conjunction with, with all the regulators, and, th and that would pick up examples around potential conflicts between river, river quality and bathing quality. We'll identify those potential needs, and then those go ultimately to uh, ministers for approval. For, to, do they agree that those are the needs that we should uh, investigate? Once we've got ministerial approval to those needs, we will then go off and appraise what are the best ways in which we can uh, meet those needs and then develop uh, solutions that will be subject to scrutiny. And all those th solutions will be appraised. Those appraisals will, for example, be uh, reviewed by our, our economic regulator. They will all undoubtedly have pound notes attached because it will cost something to deliver them. And therefore, they'll be very much in our record of what, it, what we've actually invested in delivering whether it's an investment programme or indeed uh, some of these uh, other uh, activities. Okay, thank you. Um, now on to questions about household behaviour change. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, we're told that Dunkeldon Burnham uh, is the first water efficient village uh, in Scotland. Um, how did that happen? And what role did you have in that? And how can we make that happen elsewhere? So, first of all, um, we've got a, a significant focus on water efficiency in terms of actually trying to reduce the kind of, uh, you know, per capita consumption of water um, of all of our customers use every day. And this is really about making sure we've got sustainable supply now, but also into, into the future. So we've been working for the last uh, number of years with the Energy Saving Trust uh, in particular uh, about um, how we can deliver water efficiency advice and really trying to then think about changing uh, customers' behaviour. So it's how do we long -term change kind of uh, long-term behavioural change for, for customers? Um, and part of that's actually about the link between water use and energy usage, so there's, there's a multiple benefit there. As part of that, we've been doing trials and doing... Um, in terms of trying uh, uh, very physical changes, but also into um, kind of uh, leaflets and information. As part of that, actually, um, this summer, as you mentioned, we named um, uh, Dunkeldon Burnham Scotland's first water efficient uh, village. And that because they came and reached out to us. They came very much to us uh, for terms of as for our support in water efficiency um, because they got themselves some very or set themselves some fairly uh, very positive sustainability uh, goals. So we worked with the community for the last year in terms of putting in water saving measures, information, and on the back of that, we've saved over one million litres of water, or that community, actually, you know, that community themselves have saved over one million communities of water. And given the conversations we're having about uh, carbon, for example, that's three and a half tonnes of, of CO2 saved as part of that. And that's now embedded, that approach is very much embedded now in that community, and we'd hope that's a, you know, a long-term saving. And the question for us is then, how do we get other communities across Scotland to, to build into that? And we've done some work with Gallas Shields and other communities, and it's a, you know, a long-term journey for us in terms of getting that water-efficient behaviour embedded into, into all of us. Do you want to move on to ask questions about the uh, non-domestic sector? 
Or are uh, you... I'm going to do that right, in a okay. second. Just, but just I, carry on. I'll just I, let you go. I've just got a little bit on that. I mean, I've just done a quick calculation. So that means if, it, if it's a million litres of water, they say that, I think, is about two and a half million tonnes of water. Or it's, it's in that territory, anyway. That, that you are not now having to pay for moving around. So, so as well as that being a huge environmental benefit, it's also presumably a significant reduction in cost for Scottish Water, who I believe are the biggest energy user in, in Scotland. So how are you sharing that benefit with communities? And if you do that, will that encourage other communities to follow them, kill them, burn them? So, I mean, I think, I mean, I think in terms of the, <clears throat> if I deal with the kind of the, the economic side, the whole uh, regulatory framework is designed to make sure that we drive up the service, we deliver customers and minimise the costs that we incur. Because the benefits of any financial savings that we make get, go back to customers, uh, ultimately in the form of the, either the charge levels they pay or the additional investment that we're able to uh, deliver. So while it might not be uh, directly back in that case into, into the community in Dunkel and Burnham, you, the, the benefit of that is shared uh, across the country, as is the benefit of any other savings uh, that, we, that, that we make. But I think... The, the, the whole area of, of working with our customers, the conversation earlier about working partnership, working with our customers is something we have been doing more successfully and, it, and it's got to be a, a, a ripe area for the future. So we've, we've made very good progress, for example, in driving down instances of blockages in our sewers by reducing you know, wet wipes and other inappropriate items being, being flushed down sewers. Made good progress, but there's still more to, to go at. But, and again, that's benefits to customers and it's savings to us and it's savings, again, that can be shared across the customer base. Uh, I've decided that uh, a million litres is actually 2,500 tonnes, three orders of magnitude wrong in my first estimate, so my apologies um, for, 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 for that. I just couldn't quite remember the gallon of water was £10 and doing the calculation. Never mind, that's not the end of that. Um, but turning perhaps to the issue of uh, business stream and uh, Joe Dow, um, and what business stream who are essentially selling the services of Scottish Water to business customers. What role do you have in um, driving efficiencies in the non-domestic sector that you are servicing? And, and, and indeed, for that matter, since I, I believe you have business out with Scotland, are you doing it for people elsewhere as well? Sure. I think as a responsible business, we recognise the importance of making sure that our own business is adopting sustainable practices. So to that end, we use the business in the community responsible business map to define um, how our contribution to society, the environment, uh, local communities, etc., cetera, um, sits within our organisation. So we kind of launched a new vision around making a positive difference earlier on this year. I think as a retailer to business customers that we recognise that we've got a key leadership role to play as well. So if you look across the UK, about 25% of all the water that's consumed in the UK is consumed by business customers. So we have now 340,000 business customers across the UK, which is about 20% of the total market. So we recognise that we have a key role to play um, there, help and encourage our customers to use less water. So to that end, about a year ago, we launched a pledge whereby we've committed to support all of our customers to help them to use 20% less water. And that's a really bold kind of statement, but we do that on the basis of an understanding that the average business in the UK is using 30% more water than they should be. So for us, the, the benefits are twofold. So if we can encourage them to use less water, they're obviously helping the environment, but they're also significantly reducing their water bills as well. And it's a sustainable year-on-year -year reduction that's applied. Yes, I was going to come to the point of bills, because clearly if you're selling 20% less product to your customers, and you do so by metering, um, rather than delivery of services, Scottish Water essentially do, um, that's a direct hit to your income. So how, how do you deal with that? We do it knowing that that will have an impact on our income and our profitability, but we do it because it's the right thing to do. So if we don't encourage our customers to use less water, somebody else will. So a key aspect of our um, kind of vision as a responsible business is about doing the right thing. And to me, that's about more than financial returns. That is about how do we make a positive contribution to the environment and society as a whole. 
And if you do the right thing better than everyone else, your business may grow. Absolutely. However, we'll, 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 we'll just kind of park that one. That's it, just can you give us an example of how you, what, what things you, you do to encourage people to, to use less water in business? Often it's really simple measures. So if you look at about 80% of our customers across the UK are SMEs, so really small businesses. So more often than not, they may just have a tap and a toilet. But actually by fitting aerators to the taps, by looking at dual flush mechanisms on the toilets, you can save a huge amount of water. The other area that we tackle as well is hidden leaks. So if a customer has a leak, you know, there's an awful lot of water that's been wasted. So we can help in, in that side too. With some of our larger industrial customers, we um, can look at a whole range of options, but that would include things like grain, grey rainwater harvesting, etc. So I think a, a big spectrum really of things that we can do to help our customers use less water. Okay. I have a final question before we, we, we let you go, and, and that's in terms of population growth and movement of population. How are you factoring those things into how are you factoring those things into your, your, your economic strategy? So, <clears throat> but we, we are both at, a, I guess, at a, a strategic and a, and, 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 and a specific location. So there's no doubt we're, we're, we're seeing the trends that, that, that we all are of, 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 a, of a growing population, of a general move from west to east in the country. But we're also seeing, with, of particular relevance to our business, is the fact that the growth in households is exceeding the growth in, 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 in population. So we're very aware of, of those trends. And that's then really informing how we work strategically with local authorities and with developers to make sure that we understand where future development is likely and we can support that uh, really effectively. So that's in a, in a strategic sense, and we're very much engaging, looking in a two to you know, 10, 15 year horizon in, in that sense, kind of with local authorities and major developers. And then in terms of individual investment, we will very much factor in, uh, into account when we're looking at specific investment proposal, what do we envisage as being the credible growth within an area within, within a, a foreseeable uh, time horizon? So you might have a situation now because of like, digital connectivity being a lot better where you see that there's large companies growing uh, deciding to go to more sort of like towns or more outlying rather than in cities and that's going to have a big impact on water capacity and use as well you have how are you factoring that in well, it, you, you particularly with business you really have to look at it on a on a on a on a, on a case by case basis what we have done in in recent years is is it, with the support of the Scottish government is to change our, our policy to make it much more pro business on supporting the water supply side with the wastewater side, we have to be a bit more careful because the nature of one company's effluent may be really quite different to the characteristics of another company's effluent. And while we very much want to accommodate the growth ambitions of any individual company, we've got to make sure we do it in a way that from a, a financial angle is fair to the generality of our customer base. So there may be a cost sharing mechanism that's required there, but we, we try to be as pro-business growth as well as supporting household growth uh, as we can. Okay. Mark, you wanted to yeah, um, ask? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about what you see as the threats or potentially opportunities from trade deals. Um, obviously, you're a regulated state utility. Um, could that be challenged? Or indeed, could business streams see an opportunity to be, I don't know, supplying the business water to customers in the US? Or what? how does that sit within your kind of corporate understanding of what the risks are and opportunities going forward? Um, I think we are trying to keep abreast of all the different possibilities that we can see uh, around all things Brexit related and what could kind of flow thereafter. And I guess what we're trying to do is to look at the most uh, credible scenarios and, and look at how we uh, plan for those and then respond to the rest. So I think in terms of the specific of uh, trade deals, we at the moment have not um, considered any particular threats uh, from those, but a lot might depend just on what the nature of those uh, could be. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to round up this session uh, just now. I'm going to suspend it. Thank you very much for your time this morning. We'll suspend this meeting to allow a change in panel. Thank you.
Welcome back. We are continuing to hear evidence on Scottish Water's future investment priorities, and I'm delighted to welcome Peter Peacock, the Chair, and Sam uh, Jabaldan, uh, the Director of the Customer Forum for Water. Um, Sam, did I say your name correctly? Is that not always good, but... Apologies. <laughs> to be fair, it's close to the most. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask my, my colleague, Finley Carson, to start off the line of questioning for you. Uh, thank you. I, I, I want to apologise. I've got to leave straight after this, this question, so thank you for, for letting me on. Um, the, the, the forum uh, is set up to, to try and achieve the highest possible level of, of customer and community focus within Scottish Water's practice. Um, can you explain exactly to the committee what your, your role is within that and how you, you approach representing customers? So give us some an idea of how uh, the public engage with you and at what level do they engage and in, under what circumstances? OK. Um, I mean, we're essentially we were created to uh, try and take a customer voice right to the heart of the process that Douglas Millican and his colleagues were uh, describing. And I suppose that the question we're constantly asking of Scottish Water is why is it that what you're proposing in the interest of customers? Uh, and if they can give us convincing explanations, we'll probably go along with them. If they can't, we'll ask them to go and reconsider matters, to come back with different proposals, to drop a proposal, maybe introduce a new proposal. Um, so that's the kind of disposition that we take. Now, how do we have a legitimacy in making any points to Scottish Water? Because we are just individuals like any other uh, citizen. And we try to do that by um, putting ourselves in the place of customers, if they had the chance to be quizzing Scottish Water as we do every month, uh, what were the questions they would be asking? Try and get some rigour into all of that and, and try and represent customers in that way. But the real legitimacy comes by understanding what customers themselves think. So we do a lot of research and we do a lot of research with other stakeholders in the industry. And in fact, the, the customer forum, uh, one of our members chairs, I think called the Research Coordinating Group, on which we sit, Citizens Advice Scotland sit, Scottish Water sit, SEPA, Drinking Water Quality Regulator, Scottish Government and the, and the Industry Commission. And sometimes we commission research jointly, sometimes we commission research individually, but we've checked it out and coordinated it with our colleagues. And we've done something like 20 different research exercises in the last couple of years. We've engaged with many um, hundreds, if, if not thousands indeed, uh, of customers. And on top of that, Scottish Water themselves are doing regular uh, customer engagement and feedback, and we get access to all of the data that they've got if we want that access. So there's a big process of engagement in that sense. Um, and one of our more recent research exercises, we do, we do quantitative surveys of people. Um, and more recently, we've done a big exercise involving about 100 people where we've taken groups of citizens away in, uh, in Hoyk and Falkirk and Fort William and Glasgow. Glasgow and Dundee, I think. And we spent a day with them, not me personally, but people on our behalf spent a day with them, talking about the issues around the water industry, what, that, what they might mean for people, uh, and then working out, are people's opinions shifting on the basis of more information they get? What are they actually saying about their water service? What do they think about it? Trying to get a whole series of understandings in those ways. And then we come back to the regular meetings we're having with all the stakeholders and developing the strategic plan, and we're using that data to, to articulate and argue quite strongly for positions on behalf of customers uh, on occasion in that process. So I think that's the, that's the essential way in which we are doing it. So I should say one thing, perhaps, that that has guided our work, and you, we, you might, the committee might want to see this, actually. We put in the conversation that was happening about a year ago, just over a year ago, uh, a document about um, talking about what would be, what's the social contract between the people who pay the bills for Scottish Water and what the company offer us, the people, by way of services. And it covers a whole range of things and starts really from the premise that Scottish Water being a publicly owned company, there are very particular expectations on the citizen from Scottish Water. High ethical standards are required, very open and transparent uh, in all that they do. Uh, not only have they got to deliver clean water uh, and, and take our waste away and clean it before they put it back to the environment, they've got to relate to their communities more effectively uh, in future. Um, they've got to, take, to pursue one planet approach to prosperity in future, increasing uh, cutting of carbon emissions and so on and so on and so on. We've got about 20 odd points in that, which the committee might find quite helpful. And that kind of states a position viewed from a customer perspective of what we think we want on behalf of customers in return for the money that we pay for the services. So I hope that answers. Yeah, that's, that's a very uh, a good answer. I, I, there's two things I want to touch on. You, you, you 
you mentioned the social license. Do you benchmark with other organisations? They're not necessarily um, public owned bodies, but do you benchmark Scottish Water against other utility companies uh, to find out whether they're actually delivering the level yeah. or, or above the level of standard that other companies with the, with the same... Yes, with I mean, actually, I, I chaired the customer forum during the last period of review as well, and during that period, the then customer forum argued strongly for what we called a high esteem test. So how did Scottish Water not only compare with other utilities, because actually comparing with other utilities is not a very high benchmark, because utilities are very often you know, low, low scores compared to your Amazons and uh, other institutions and other uh, commercial organisations. So Scottish Water, on the back of that, introduced a customer experience measure for both households and for business customers, so they can monitor direct customer experience of their services. But that's an internal thing uh, within Scottish Water. And then they're also part of something I called the UK something index, uh, which looks at all uh, utilities and other companies, and it benchmarks itself against all of that. And we've just had a meeting with Scottish Water in the last six weeks where we looked at their performance against other industries. It's been improving, and in the utilities sector, Scottish Water is seen as a very good performer, but it's still not as high as some of the best performers in the private sector. But Scottish Water are very alert to that, and that bit of the organisation is very keen to make sure they continue to perform well on that. So there are means of, of starting to do that. Can, can I ask a, a quick question? You're, what are the, the main things that are coming out from consumers? What, what are the main issues... Um, well, <laughs> or is that just well, too broad I mean, a the, question? There, there are, I mean, it's fundamental. It's a, it's a big, complex subject actually, because we've got so many surveys looking at different things. Uh -huh. But if you if you boil it right down, I mean, customers are essentially content, not content. They want to see a maintenance of their current service levels. By and large, people have got a very high regard for what they get from Scottish Water. It is largely, and despite what Mr Carson said earlier, this is a largely uninterrupted uh, service that they get. It's of high quality. Uh, and Scottish Water have got a reputation for being pretty responsive. We know from survey work that Scottish, the public in Scotland by and large trust Scottish Water. And indeed they have pride not only in the product, water to drink, but a bit of pride in the company as well. So there's a sort of high regard for that, and they want to maintain all of that. That's the first key thing. Within that, there are big challenges, because unless you replace your assets, you can't maintain your yeah. service, and that's one of the big cost pressures that's coming through. Second big thing, and we've seen a big change in this over the last few years of surveying, climate change has moved absolutely centre stage, uh, and people are anxious about climate change, and they want to make sure that Scottish Water does the right thing they themselves want to be helped to do the right thing. And there was earlier questions of Scottish Water about how the customer behaviour change, yeah. uh, you know, in order to both reduce their costs but do the right thing by the environment. So customers are keen to learn more about that. And that, that exercise we've, I, I referred to that we've just done with a, about 100 customers in depth shows that they are keen to understand much more about Scottish Water, partly because they know there's pressure on prices uh, upward pressure potential in prices because of climate change and because of the need to replace assets. So how do they get guaranteed they're getting good value for money uh, out of all of that? Uh, and how do you persuade people that actually it might be the right, th I'm not, it's not my job to persuade them this, but how do they themselves consider is it the right thing to do to pay slightly more to address the climate crisis, mm. for example? Uh, and we're beginning to you know, get some insights into that and to understand um, you know what, what that means, but maybe Sam can add. There's another couple of things probably that customers. Oh well, yeah, I mean I think I think that in, the, in the research exercise Peter referred to, um, which was a sort of a day and a half of active engagement and presentations and deliberation and and working around. Um, obviously, that as Peter mentioned, the, the key thing was people want to maintain their quality of drinking water and, and reliability of wastewater services. Um, they wanted Scottish Water to play a leading role, and I think that's quite an important definitely a leading role in, in tackling climate change. Um, there have been a very noticeable difference, I think, as I suppose Peter mentioned, that's becoming much more uh, of a mainstream view. And one of, the, one of the things for us in this research was that we were able to look at the, the, the relative views on climate change of different generations. Um, and I suppose we went into that with the mindset that probably it would be much more uh, important to the younger generation for perhaps obvious reasons, they've grown up with it, they had education at school. And, and that, came, that very much came out that the sort of climate change is perhaps, you know, 
the most important thing to the younger generation with kind of reliability and quality of service very closely behind. But one of the very interesting things for us, I think, was that the, the older generation um, also thought climate change was an exceptionally important thing to deal with. Um, and that's perhaps a bit of a shift, perhaps. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell, but th th there is, there is, there's a definite movement in that direction. Um, other things that came out of, I suppose, that research was that the, there is a desire to see Scottish Water as a publicly owned company delivering what you might call enhanced or additional public benefit. So when it, when it is doing something, um, when it's carrying out some kind of capital investment work or whenever it's doing something in its communities, it's thinking about how could it do that in such a way it might maybe provide a footpath that provided access somewhere, it might, um, it, might, it might do other activities, perhaps in partnership with communities that are designed to um, deal with catchment area flooding or something of that nature. Um, the, the other key thing, I think, I think Peter touched on this, was that there was a real desire I mean, what, it, it was really fascinating for observing some of those groups. Um, the more people understood about Scottish Water and its operations and how the water cycle works, the more they wanted to know about it, and the more they could relate it to their, the kind of the way it worked in their communities. Um, so there's, there's a real desire, to, I suppose, to know more and to understand more about how they can do things and how they can do things to change. I think that relates to the question you asked in the previous session about behaviour change. And on top of that, relating that to... Um, we want to know more, and part of the also reason we want to know is we want to know we're getting value for money, um, and that that is it also a key, I suppose, customer concern. They are, uh, I think, what the research showed was that they they actually feel on the whole that they probably are paying a fairly reasonable cost at the moment, but they want to know that that's value for money, and they will continue to get value for money in the future. Okay. Could I just add one yeah. other point that, that's important to balance this as well? That taking people away and talk to them in depth and explaining the climate challenge and what that means for services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's not immediately obvious to people. And some of your earlier conversations today have touched on that. But when you do talk to them, people are remarkably sensible, sane, balanced, level-headed. They get it and they understand the challenges and they're prepared to contemplate change on the back of that. If you don't give them that information, the data from customers is somewhat different. They're somewhat resistant to price changes above the rate of inflation. I mean, there's differing evidence on this, but some quite strong evidence we've got. When customers were asked, 600 customers were asked their prior position before getting any information about anything of what they thought about water prices and the possibility of them increasing, over 80% didn't want them increasing above inflation. And that's why we've done this other exercise to say, well, look, if you engage with people, if you engage with communities, if you help them to understand does their disposition to this change, and therefore does what might be coming down the tracks of potential pressure on water prices uh, and other services and taxation you would out through other services, does that become more acceptable if people understand? And what the lesson I think we're learning from that is, you know, don't expect to be carried from the room shoulder high with adoring crowds cheering you if you just put up water prices and don't explain them. If, on the other hand, you have a serious, big engagement exercise, and again, some of your earlier conversations about, uh, with the Climate Change uh, Committee about um, social engagement, if you have serious engagement, the signs are people get it. Uh, and, it, you know, to me, as trying to represent customers in this process, customers have got a right to know where their money goes, they've got a right to understand and to be told and to allow to appreciate. And if you don't give them that right, well, you're probably heading into difficult territory. Uh, if you do fulfil that, you're probably kind of a very serious set of conversations with people about what are very real challenges. Thank you. And you want to come back in? A, a very short yes-no answer will probably suffice. Um, your interventions on behalf of communities with Scottish Water, uh, are they uh, always at a high level or do you get involved in individual communities with individual Scottish Water projects? We get involved with individual communities, but the scenario you painted earlier... Uh, we have seen, uh, I'll, I'll name you three examples. I live near the village of Ardorseer. There are signs outside Ardorseer still saying Scottish water keep out. Uh, the village of Gairlock in the West Highlands hit the headlines a few a couple of years ago for problems, uh, and Abbey Moore had big problems. These are ones in my immediate knowledge. We have raised all of those with Scottish water. I think the fact that you and I can name four or five of these, despite the fact there are hundreds of projects going on, means this is not the biggest thing but we know we've raised all of that and we've also done research jointly with Scottish Water 
and Citizens Advice Scotland looking at better community engagement methods and recommending to Scottish Water the need to gear up their practices in this. And Scottish Water are currently running three pilots, uh, or about to start three pilots, looking at how you engage communities more effectively in, in the delivery of capital projects earlier. It was a point Douglas Millican made earlier. Scottish Water are good once they've decided what to do to come and tell you we're coming to your community in six weeks' time to do this. They haven't been so good at going right back up the process and saying, we're actually thinking we might have to do something in your community in the next decade. Here's what it might be. How do, you how do we involve you in deciding the best way to do that? What are the wider public benefits we can get on the back of that? That's a big culture change for Scottish Water, but we think they're addressing it and they're trying to do what they now call building in uh, community engagement, not bolting it on as an afterthought. Sorry, that's not a one word. Uh, one that was, word that was a good answer. answer. I might just add to that. So, um, I mean, obviously, in providing information and engagement with communities and, and people generally, uh, companies like Scottish Water have to publish things on the website. They will write to people, they'll put leaflets through people's doors. But there is um, there's clear evidence, I suppose, and I think they're learning this from their own pilots, which, which have started, is that sometimes they have to be a bit more imaginative about the way they do that. So one of the examples, I'm struggling to remember the name of the village, but I went to a meeting to hear the evaluation of this project last what did we call the week before, um, was that there was a, somewhere on the west coast where they were looking at lead um, and lead replacement, uh, and they had found that going to the local pub quiz and talking to people there was one of the most effective ways of engaging. So th there, is, there is a thing about, there, there, you know, there, there's a genuine appreciation within Scottish Water, I think, that they need to think more imaginatively about the way they do this type of process. Um, and there is a, you know, they're learning about how to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you convener. Um, could, could I ask um, whichever of you it's most appropriate to answer? Um, I'm very interested in the social contract and you've, you've explored with us quite a lot of the aspects of that. You said there's a 20 point plan, if I, if I read, read that correctly from what you were saying. Um, do you think there are areas where Scottish Water is listening well to the customer forum and, and your emphasis on a social contract and the things you've been describing? And are there areas where things could improve, if we could have that? Well, um, we'll send you a copy of, this, of the document so you can see it. I think there's about 17 different points in it. Sorry, um, 17. <laughs> and it's got very particular context. But, but anyway, we'll send it, that to you and the committee might find, find that helpful. Uh, very honestly, uh, um, Scottish Water are a pretty remarkable company to deal with, in my view. Um, they are, with us in private, where we are meeting in private, they are extraordinarily open. Uh, and the, I mean, one of the characteristics of the chief executive is that he will not promise to do anything unless he's actually prepared to do it. So whilst when we have engaged with Scottish Water, we quite often get a little bit of pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, we've come to learn that's for a very good reason, because the chief executive buying himself time to say, I hadn't heard this before, I hadn't thought about this before, I'm going to need to go away and think about this, and I'm not going to promise you anything. Invariably, he'll come back within a couple of months and say, you know, we did have that conversation, we think we could do this in this way, maybe not the way you thought. So they, are, they do listen, and they do, I mean, I am genuinely impressed with how they want to try and do the right thing by customers and by communities. We can debate what the right thing is, and we don't always agree with Scottish Water, uh, and we push them very hard on some things, and they will push back on things if they think we've got you know, ideas wrong or they're not practical. But generally speaking, I think they are, they are to be commended for what they try to do to take things seriously and to move the world further forward. Was there any comment from yourself, Sam, on that? No, I, I would entirely agree with that. Um, the, the chief executive, indeed, throughout the, throughout the company, the levels we deal with, people um, throughout the strategic review process have been open and engaged. And I think that one of the, one of the important and interesting things about it is that the, this, this strategic review has really gone into huge amounts of depth. I mean, there have been, I, I have no idea how many meetings I've been to and everybody else, but there have been probably hundreds over the last two or three years looking at lots of issues in great detail, which has meant that individuals at several different levels within Scottish Water have had to open up to a range of regulators, people like the Customer Forum, and have actually had to start, in, in itself, this process has made them have to start to think about the kind of wider context for what they do, rather than just, we're some engineers, we need to build something. Um, and it, it's a bit of a cultural shift, I suppose, and the process itself is opening up Scottish Water to that kind of consideration. Um, 
as, as Peter says, at the kind of senior level, but also in other parts of the organisation. I think that's been something that's been very valuable. Thank you. Two questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I think we've covered perhaps elements of the tone of the discussion um, between different partners in relation to the development of the investment plan and the strategic review um, already. But could you give us a bit more of a kind of nuts and bolts answer to how, how you actually work with government, Scottish Water, and, and the Commission on these two pieces of work? How does this, how does this process actually work? Where does, where does the, the views from the customer forum come into that process? And where does it, how does it get, get formally dealt with? Okay, well, um, we as a forum meet every month, and we would normally have an hour, two hours of Scottish Water every month. They would come and present to us on some aspect of their work, give us a chance to probe, to understand, and so on. This time around, in the last few months, it's been more about the detail of the strategic plan and what's emerging. So that's one mechanism. However, the main mechanism throughout this review has been uh, a group chaired by Scottish Water, which is called the Strategic Advisory Group. And around that table sits the Water Industry Commission, Scottish Government, the Customer Forum, Citizens Advice Scotland, Scottish Water itself, obviously, uh, the Drinking Water Quality Regulator, and SIPA. And we meet every month. And we talk about all of the things that are required in relation to the strategic plan. That group inevitably has spawned many other groups. There are nine different groups, including that one. So we've had um, groups looking at the water service, at the wastewater service, uh, what's been called Flourishing Scotland, which is looking at the wider role of Scottish water in relation to uh, meeting national uh, outcomes and the strategic development goals, for example. We've had a group looking at the investment prioritisation framework for the future asking the kind of questions that I think Douglas Millican referred to about, or David Satie referred to about, you know, when you appraise a project, what in future will you appraise it against? What are the criteria? So we had a group looking at that, a group looking at performance measures, and so on. And the forum has been part of all of that. There are, there are, the two, there are two groups, that, or three groups, that the Scottish, Water, Scottish Government chair, which we're not part of, but apart from that, we're part, a full part of the process and we're full participants in the process and trying to bring into that process a customer view in the way that I described earlier. So that, that's the kind of mechanics of it. Yeah, yeah. And does that model work? I mean, would there, would there be anything that you would, you would change about that? Is that, is that well, an this, effective this, this platform has been, to feed customer views? This has yeah. been hugely resource intensive. Mm, it has like taken it. up a colossal amount of time. And um, I, I was interested in questions that Mr. MacDonald was asking earlier in, in, in the panel too. The, the, the OECD have been sitting alongside this process and are independently evaluating it. And we haven't, they haven't done that evaluation yet, obviously. They're observing the process and they're looking at it and they're considering the regulatory implications. And at some point, the OECD will, will make a report at the end of this process, which will help people think back through the process of what have been the good things about it, but what else might have been lost in the process compared to traditional regulation, because this is all very new. Uh, but to be reassured that there is an independent appraisal process running alongside this. And I would hope it would probe these questions about, you know, would something like this again be sustainable? Um, I mean, I, I've, we've got 10 members of the forum. They have been away at all these working groups participating. That creates big challenges for us of coordinating that. What are the lines to take? How do we feedback and brief our colleagues? There are big, big uh, resource questions from that. But there are also wider um, questions of the sort Mr. Um, McDonald was getting into earlier that I think the evaluation will, will begin to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that evaluation going to also look at international examples? I mean, is, it, is this quite unique in Scotland? Or it's, cause I'm it, aware of other it, it's pretty you know, unique. industries that are Stockholm Vata, for example, where you've got a municipally owned um, you know, water utility operating within a city. I mean, I, I don't know how they kind of yep. deal with these kind of processes if they have a similar kind of structure of, in, yep. of engaging with the public and other stakeholders or if this is a uniquely Scottish Well, thing. It, it, it is pretty unique. Uh, and this is an evolution of the first process, which was, a, was itself pretty unique, which was for the last or the current period we're in, but was, you know, ran up to 2015, uh, which I was also involved in. That was pretty unique. And this is an evolution of that, uh, involving the regulators more than, and the government more than in the past. Uh, and, I, and it was evaluated. Uh, by an academic independently, but I guess the reason that the OECD 
are doing this, and it's the regulatory bit of the OECD that advises on regulatory policy internationally and across all the sectors. I guess the reason that they're doing this is because, for, for that precise reason, yeah. is, you know, are there other lessons in other jurisdictions that you can learn from? And there's a group of peer reviewers come from the OECD every year. Uh, they're coming this month, I think, later this month, and they will interview all the stakeholders, and those are regulators from other countries. So there's somebody from Mexico, there was an Italian member of that, and so on and so forth, a French member of that, uh, a South African, mm -hmm. I could go on. So uh, there is a kind of international dimension to that evaluation. Yeah. yeah. So, so what have your, been your objectives for the strategic review of charges then? What, what has fed into all of these working groups from... from well, I guess, uh, again, if we give you the social contract document, it'll give you a clue as to what, yeah. we, were, what we were fishing for, if you like. I mean, you know, the, the simple line is we want to get the best level of service for the lowest overall, lowest possible cost. That's quite a tension. We have played a fairly uh, big role in raising aff affordability questions for customers because we want to make sure that, cu that customers, the price is generally affordable as well as it's specifically affordable to those in the most vulnerable circumstances. That's a policy matter for government, and we haven't been involved in the detail of that, nor would we be. It's, it, it, but making the general point that, you know, customers are facing tough economic, economic times. We're in the most uncertain political and economic circumstances any of us have ever known. What's that going to mean for the economy going forward? Therefore, how do we make sure that whatever the services are that are coming through that you know they are affordable by the general population so that's one dimension to what we've been doing we have pushed very hard on climate things um and we've been doing so for 18 months or more i have to say that the first minister's uh, climate emergency um, speech earlier in the year and then the program for government has focused minds wonderfully inside this sector uh and but not, and we've seen that issue move from not in the centre stage, to be absolutely centre stage uh, today, and we've pushed a lot for that. But we've also pushed on things like we've asked questions about, you know, a lot of rural supplies. Um, people are still on private supplies. Might they want the option to connect to the main supply? We've pushed a bit about lead. There's still a lot of uh, households that suffer the consequences of having lead. Some of it's in their own piping. It's not in the public's network. But what do we do to, to sort that out? Um, you know, a whole range of things across the service issues that we've pushed for. And again, those are reflected in that document that we'll, yep. we'll send you. Okay. I don't know if you've seen the Scottish Water, well, actually not the Scottish Water, the Water Industry Vision, um, which was, I think, published last month. Uh, that encapsulates, I suppose, a lot of what we have been pushing for. And we, with other stakeholders, were, were involved in writing that. And it certainly deals with puts up front the vision for the next 20, 25 years for Scottish Water is very much dealing with things like climate change, better services to communities, trying to make sure that um, there's excellent quality water throughout Scotland, um, and, and also, again, that value for money point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Claudia, do you have a question? Just yes, yes. Yeah, actually. Thank you, convener. Uh, a lot of what I was going to ask about changing externalities and how that relates to the, um, your social contract and, and your role as the forum. Have, have been answered, and very reassuringly, if I may say, from my own perspective, I can't speak for the whole committee. Um, but as a customer forum, are you able and are you empowered to relate to other um, organisations and, and public bodies like local authorities when it comes to dealing with, say, the climate emergency in relation to something such as SUDS or what's been termed recently in the media as urban creep, you know, lots and lots of extensions. And I know those are on private properties, but just generally, to give two examples, but you may have others. I, I completely get your point, and I was fascinated by the discussion earlier with the Climate Change Committee about some of this stuff, because we see this practically in the discussions that we're in the midst of. And we, the answer, short answer to your question is no, we don't have a locus in talking to those bodies. Mm -hmm. What we have said very firmly and clearly to Scottish Water is that they sit in a very unique position here and they see the implications of the policies of other agencies. So your urban creep point, you know, as, as, as more roofs are put on over more land, so you've got more fast runoff uh, yeah. or drainage. As more people tarmac or, tie, or, or pave their drive with, mm. Im, with impervious surfaces, mm. then you've got faster runoff. From a customer point of view, we're saying to Scottish Water, if you know that, 
you've got an obligation to say that to government and to try and push for change in development mm -hmm. control and planning regulations, et cetera, et cetera, because otherwise it's a customer that pays the consequence. They pay the price. It's not unnecessary in cash terms if we could eliminate the problems upstream. Mm -hmm. So if our building control was significantly different in some respects, holding water back around properties before releasing it into the system, uh, so then that all helps. So the tying up of policy, we have tried to say to Scottish Water, we think they ought to be more active on. I have to say that they have responded to that, uh, I think, and I think you'll see some stuff about that in their emerging strategic plan. But there's so many things that connect to this agenda that in a sense, Scottish, I mean, not in a sense, Scottish Water have got a major challenge to think about how they deliver services over the next 40 and more years, because the answer to previous problems has been really to engineer your way out of them. Yes. And they're very good at that. They're highly accomplished and skilled at doing that. That is probably not sustainable in its full sense in the future. Mr. Milligan, Douglas Milligan made a point about they don't want to do a lot of offsetting. They want to solve the problem mm -hmm. and they will. They'll probably have to do some offsetting uh, as well. But there's a fundamental change required. And part of that is making sure, and we think, we think Scottish Water's got a role in this, uh, it's, Scottish, well, it's making sure that government policy at the wider level connects. And I thought your conversation with the Climate Change Committee today was, you know, was, was, was echoing exactly that and saying how do you make sure in delivering all of this that all public policy is joined up. Thankfully, not my job. Can I add one point to that? The, I think there was a question earlier on about behaviour change. Um, I think what we know about changing people's behaviour is that you have to make that change easy and preferably aspirational um, and, and that is the way to achieve sustainable long-term change you, you, you make the new behavior almost simpler to do than what, what was happening before um, and in terms of many of the issues Scottish Water face that it is critical that that involves planning consent planning authorities local authorities um, because that's going to be working with developers uh, to do things like permeable services surfaces sorry um, sort of what, putting into new buildings, things for collecting rainwater, for grey water, for garden use, whatever. And it's that type of more imaginative thing that they actually do need third parties, third agencies to act on. And actually, Scottish Water and SEPA are working on some of that um, for the future, where there's a very you know, clear relationship. Of, I mean, sepa has got this dual role here. It's got the enforcement in relation to licensing and regulation, discharge and so on. But they've also got the One Planet Prosperity role. Uh, sometimes those are slightly in conflict, and SEPA are, you know, I think being, doing some really positive work with Scottish Water and, continue, and Scottish Water with SEPA to try and look at some of these issues more expansively for the future. You've touched on, on how, how it might be possible that from your engagement with customers that they might be interested in considering, if they're not vulnerable customers, being able to pay more for things that they understand as within a developing conversation, say within the relationship with the climate emergency. Do you see that there's any role for yourselves in um, taking forward suggestions about incentivising customers, for instance, to, um, to save, for, um, to put in systems for, for grey water or for any of the, the things you've mentioned, or is that not really part of your role? We haven't looked at those things in, in particular, although we have had conversations with Scottish Water about how they advise customers about using less water which takes you into some of that territory. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, we've talked in the past about, you know, is there, a, is there a service Scottish Water can offer beyond the fence into the private property, which looks at lead and whether there's lead in that property, looks at leakage and whether there's leakage, yeah. looks at water use. Uh, and, you know, the simple techniques you can do to, to reduce water use, looks at how you can store more water on your property from flooding and so on. And uh, I, I mean, we've raised all those questions with Scottish Water, and I would hope over time they'll continue to make progress in that. But there's a whole range of complex things in there that they need to look at. But there's much more. I mean, it, it comes to some of your earlier points that, to Scottish Water, particularly for Mr. Carson, about um, engaging with communities. I and mean, Scottish Water, when you think, you know, it, it, it would be odd in, in the past world of Scottish Water to say, look, and I'm not making this as a suggestion, but would it be worth having in a catchment area where all of this stuff makes sense, actually, begins to make sense, would it be worth having, you know, Scottish Water having a member of staff with other agencies which is actually going around and animating the community to do all these things and do much more community partnerships to allow communities to, you know, have, have a better control of all these things that affect all of us in the water system? And if you look at it at a catchment level, 
just like your committee looks at, I mean, it brings together forestry policy, land use strategy, land ownership strategy, um, river basin management planning, etc., etc. There's a whole series of synergies there, and communities have got a large part potentially to play in that. That's a very new world for Scottish Water, uh, and it's going to take them time to be able to think their way into that, develop the skills fully to be able to do that more, but in a more participatory way. We would like to see that happen, but I'm not under any illusions that's a difficult task. I do think it is part of how you meet the wider climate challenge. And our evidence is if you engage people seriously in conversation, share with them the real challenges, they will respond. Uh, if you don't, you're not going to make a lot of progress, I suspect. One, one thing to add as well is that, um, obviously, as a customer forum, we represent uh, business customers as well as domestic customers. Um, and indeed, we have representatives of the LPs on, on, on the forum. Um, the, there, is, there is perhaps more, more of an opportunity to perhaps incentivise positive behaviour from business customers in terms of reducing their water use or in terms of installing um, drainage, dra uh, permanent drainage and things of that nature. Um, and that is certainly something we have raised with Scottish Water. And again, we've had a, a positive response. So. We are rapidly running out of time, but before we, we, we close, is there anything that you think that we should be looking at in this area that we maybe haven't covered already? Um, that's a terribly open invitation. It really <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. but I'm um, making no, it I mean, anyway. I, I think, I think that, that there is a, very, there's a major tension at the heart of this whole review, strategic review, and that is how do you make progress on replacing assets and meeting the climate challenge whilst keeping charges affordable? And you've got to think about both things. Uh, and, and somewhere in there are judgments have got to be made about all of that. So, and we've been you know, anxious about household economics and, and, and political uncertainty going forward. There's this whole point about strong customer engagement in the future. And we've been advocating not only should there be a strong role for customers into the future in checking that Scottish Water are delivering and offering value and giving the reassurance to customers that they need. There's a, there's a role for customers going forward in that. But there has to be serious engagement from Scottish Water, and they're listening strongly to this, I know, and are, are, are responding very positively to a serious engagement exercise to explain to the wider population, here are the challenges that we're facing. So that, that's important. And then there's all the, all, the, all the implications that come from being a publicly owned company, making sure that you're ethical, transparent, open, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that's all very important and, and contributing to the wider national performance uh, and national outcomes that the, that the, the government has got. Um, so it's those sort of points that are, it seems to me are important. And it's also keeping all of this under review so that if we get some of the assumptions that we're making today wrong because we've, you know, we've not fully accounted for climate change or we've over accounted for it, how do we make sure there are safeguards for customers that this can be reviewed as we go forward? These are things that are that will remain important as we as we move as we move on into the future. Okay, I want to thank you both for your time this morning. Um, that uh, concludes the committee's business in public today. It's next meeting on the 12th of November. The committee will hear evidence from stakeholders on the proposed deposit return scheme regulations. We're now going to move into private session and ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed. <laughs>